Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the Josh Smith Show. Uh, it's, today, I got a special guest, Tier Simak. He's a great friend of mine. Uh, I've known him here the last couple of years. Uh, we became friends through Black Rifle Coffee, through uh, various friends in our in our network. Uh, absolute amazing guy, uh, Sergeant Major, um, Army Medic, Green Beret, uh, horse trainer, hunter. Uh, he was the uh, he used to run the um, Veteran Fund, uh, the Black Rifle, the BRCC gives fund for Black Rifle Coffee. He still works for Black Rifle Coffee, uh, married to a beautiful woman, Nicole. Um, just a great dude. I spent some time in Idaho hunting with him with a gr- group of Black Rifle Coffee employees, uh, other good friends of mine, Mike Clancy, and um, a few of those guys, Trevor Thompson. So, uh, Tier's an amazing guy. We had him out here to do some content to help us with uh, some medical kits that we're going to be launching. Uh, and he's clearly had more... Uh, experiences you'll hear on the podcast uh than i will ever imagine having when it comes to medical stuff so tears a super good dude he's a friend of mine he's been a huge supporter of mine since we started of our company and uh, i'm excited to have him on the podcast so ladies and gentlemen welcome tear tear josh cymac that's the correct pronunciation so i have a question I'm going to go hard hitting. I hope you have several. I'm going to go deep. Or this is going to be a really short podcast. Yeah, I do have one. All right, Um, we'll go with that then. I'm going to go deep right off the bat. Deep. Why? By the way, cheers. Yeah, cheers. I am uh, honored to have you as the first guest in our not finished podcast studio. Mm. Taste of beer. So, welcome. I feel welcome. Good. It's uh, it's pretty good. There's no carpet just yet. And... uh, it's very rustic. No doorknob. It's a little echoey. I have a story about doors with no doorknobs. Oh, yeah? yeah I do. Tell me that. Do you want to ask your question first? Do you want to go straight no, to that story? No, because if I ask it, the interview might end. It <laughs> might be over. <laughs> <coughs> have I told you the story about um, my ex-wife and, and the glue? No. Was oh. she sniffing it? <sighs> I wish. <laughs> this this would have had a much happier <laughs> ending. So... Um, <clears throat> This is uh, Fort Bragg, North Carolina, or as it's known now, Fort Liberty, I think. They changed okay. it. Yeah. And uh, I'm in the Special Forces Medic course, and uh, it just was not challenging enough for me. So I married a crazy person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> mostly to prove to her that I, I did, in fact, love her. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, this crazy person, um, when I say crazy, I mean, she was clinically uh, borderline personality disorder. I know this because that's what our marriage counselor told me. Really? Yeah. Um, so he sided with you? She. She. Which, yeah. Did you marry her next? <clears throat> I should have. Was she hot? No. Okay. But it, it, she, she made good money. I she bet. had a stable career. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so uh, Voldemort, as I refer to her. Uh, she, <laughs> she liked to, she had this fake back problem, um, that, uh, the army hospital had prescribed her MS cotton for MS cotton is a pill form of morphine. And okay. she liked to take these morphine pills with a nice glass of, uh, table red and fight with me about random shit. Nice. It's just whatever, whatever was on her mind that day. Because the thing with borderline personality disorder is, uh, they're your, uh, most loyal ally, yeah, and your worst enemy. They if if things are running smooth, they have to create drama. That's that's crossed wires in there. Snakes in the brain. Nice. I'm tired of all these motherfucking snakes. <laughs> <laughs> motherfucking brain. <laughs> <laughs> so she's fighting with me about something, and this is just my life now yeah. that I've chosen for myself. And, I mean, it's uh, exciting. It, it it has its moments. Yeah. Um, I am studying because that's what you do in, uh, the 18 Delta course, the special forces medic course. You do a lot of studying. It's like going to PA school, uh, with a lot of working out as well. So, uh, she's fighting with me. I'm studying for three hours or so. At some point in there, she goes to, to the master bedroom and passes out. I study for a couple more hours and uh, I close the books up, go down the hallway put my finger through the door, through the hole in the door where the doorknob used to be, 
but I got tired of being locked out when she was having a fit. So I took the doorknobs. I grounded. I grounded her from doorknobs. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> yeah. This is next level craziness. Yeah. 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 So we weren't allowed to have locking doorknobs in, in the interior of the house. Um, How do you explain that to like friends, like at a dinner party? <laughs> <laughs> hey, you don't have any doorknobs. Oh, it's remodeling our lives. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Every night. There's a lot more to that story. Do you, you want me to keep going? Yeah, so oh. the glue. Uh, yes, okay. So um, <clears throat> she's passed out. Lights are on in there, but she is passed out, as one is wont to do on Table Red and Morphine. Mm -hmm. And uh, I decide that I'm going to watch a little TV um, before I fall asleep. I, n I never really got to that point. I just ended up passing out with my head at the foot of the bed. Um, but I wake up sometime later. And one thing, you know, everybody's seen the hot crazy matrix. Yeah. Yeah. Well, she was, she was on the hot crazy matrix. She, she had the, the crazy part down. Yeah. And uh, the thing about crazy people, a lot of them are, are pretty good in bed because they just don't have any inhibitions. Yeah. It's a, it's a trade off. It's a definite trap. One that you were willing to uh, take at the time. Uh, what I would say to your listeners is get this knocked out while you're young. Yeah. You don't <laughs> don't have kids with them. Just get it knocked out while you're young. Get get the check the block on the crazy. It makes yeah. for a good story as you know. Yeah. You know. Enjoy the carnival. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> ride the zipper. It's it's a life <laughs> choice, but it is not a lifestyle. <laughs> yeah. Um <coughs> so uh I feel, uh, I feel a reach around. She is cradling my balls. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I'm thinking, okay, great. We're going to have makeup sex. You know, that's, that's the upside to yeah. all, this, all this BS that I'm dealing with. Um, and there's something in her hand, you know, some kind of lube or something. Okay. Great. You know, that's, yeah. that's thoughtful. I <laughs> yeah. appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. And then um, <coughs> as, I'm, as I'm laying there, I haven't opened my eyes at, at this point yet. I'm, I'm just letting her do her thing. And uh, I start having these fond, just throwback memories to building model airplanes <laughs> yeah. with my dad. Uh -huh. when a, I was a little hint of that in the air. Uh, yeah, and I thought, well, that's, that's weird. My dad should not be entering into this conversation at all right now that's not that's not the stage where we are in our physicality and so uh <coughs> i realized something is dreadfully wrong and i roll over and she is sitting indian style on the bed with something clenched in each each hand and my mind is just racing I'm like what what is that that's some kind of compound what do we have in the house that's a compound is jb weld i think all we have is jb weld does jb weld work on skin i don't know that's that's what's going through my mind right now yeah and I look at her, I said, what did you do? And she's looking at me with this crazy look. Just, uh, and and just no, no response whatsoever. And I ask her again, like, what did you do? Still no response. And she's looking at me like that old, that gopher meme. That's a <laughs> <laughs> Same exact look, yeah. <clears throat> and I'm a, I'm a brand new paramedic. Um, just got my nationally registered registry. Passed my national registry test. So you're, you're pretty much a doctor. Basically, yeah. yeah, yeah, but I start uh, giving her the paramedic street talk. Like, all right, listen, it's okay. Nobody <laughs> here's in trouble, okay. I just need to see what's in your hand. <laughs> that didn't garner any response either. So I tried to pry her hand open to see what was going on because you know it's kind of like getting bit by a snake. You want to you want to know what the antidote is. Yeah, you don't have the snake. You don't know <laughs> what kind of antidote to use. Yeah, so. <clears throat> She uh, she fights me on that, and she's not a small woman. And by that, I don't mean she's large. I mean she she's five ten, and athletic. Oh wow! Yeah, so she's fighting me on this. Yeah, and she goes no. So realizing time is an issue, at this point, I roll out of bed and I go over to the or his and her vanity sinks, and I hike my <laughs> foot up on one of them. I turn that water on as hot as I can get it, and I grab a washcloth and. I pull my scrot out as much as I can, <laughs> and I just get to scrubbing. <laughs> she had, uh, she had whatever it was that she had. She had uh, adhered my scrotum to my perineum in medical terms, or in layman's speak, my my sac to my taint. 
Oh my gosh. Yeah. That is unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> at, at this point, uh, is this when the therapy started? Is this when uh, the uh, that was the, the counseling? Grounds. That was the grounds for the restraining order. Okay. Were yeah. you guys married? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. How? She must have been amazing in bed to have gotten all the way to marriage with that amount of crazy. Did you have some buddies like going, hey, Tear, um, you sure you want to marry her? I, like, I actually did. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, the day of. Um, and your parents? What? <laughs> my parents really didn't say much one way or the other because – there's two types of, two types of women. in your house and no doorknobs. Well, this is in North Carolina, and yeah. all my parents were in Oregon. And so uh, they say there's two kinds of women at Fort Bragg, the kind that are brought there and the kind that are left there. <laughs> she was both. So, yeah. <laughs> so uh, that, um, the, the, your buddies, yeah. I, was starting, I, was, I, got, yeah. I got off track here. So my buddy Bill... Uh, who did he sit you down? <laughs> he he came up to me. I got married on base. Um, okay. Uh, super fancy wedding uh, at the 18 Delta Barracks. It, it was a nice pergola. Yeah. There, and I thought, oh, that's 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 very uh, bucolic. That's that's a nice nice backdrop. Nice little touch. Yeah. With my classmates walking by the laundry room and whatnot. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> my friend Bill came up and uh, he said, hey. Uh, the keys are in my truck in the parking lot. I said, oh, okay. And I slapped him on the shoulder. I'm like, that's funny. He's like, he goes, no. The keys are in the ignition. There's a full tank of gas. Yeah. You, you can get out of here. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't even have to take him with me. I did, he was just like, just you can get out of here if you need to. Yeah. And he was, um, <clears throat> he was smarter than me. He's a... He was an E4 at the time, but I think he's an O5 now. I think he's a lieutenant colonel now. Okay. Yeah. He had just a little bit of age on him compared to you. And no. No? No. <laughs> he's younger than me. Really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. Younger that's and smarter. A, that's a dynamic. That's an interesting dynamic. That's a glue. What was the, uh, was there a discussion later? Like, hey, when maybe when she came back to reality? Yeah, the next day. After the wine wore off. Said, she just said, it wasn't so much of an apology as it was uh, as a, a reckoning, maybe, on her part. I don't know. She she said, can we please just never talk about what happened yesterday? Okay. And I went, I, I think I just gave her the like the bro nod. like Tell I'm on a podcast. Tell I'm on a podcast. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Shout out, Cynthia. <laughs> <laughs> Wherever you are. Whatever. Oh, my gosh. So how much longer was it until... Uh, you, you, uh, so the restraining order was after that. <clears throat> she somehow avoid, avoided being served with that, uh, several times. I was married less than a year. Mm -hmm. So that one, yeah. Well, yeah. Unfortunately, the, the military really incentivizes marriage. How's that? Well, you get a pay raise and you don't have to live in the barracks. Yeah. You'd pretty much marry anybody for that. And people do. Yeah. Yeah. They sure do. Um, I I really think that whole system needs to be revamped. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Did uh, so. I'm going to get back to the uh, beginning of the interview with the hard hitting question. Um, <laughs> why is it that there's letters in your name that you don't use? Oh, you're uh, you're referring to the the, the the lack of vowels and and the n and plethora of consonants. Yeah. Yeah, I was confused today. We were shooting videos, and I had to ask you <coughs> how to say your name, which is kind of embarrassing when you kind of consider someone someone a friend for at least a couple of years. Yeah, well, how do I say your name? It's not like you've been writing me letters. It's true, but I probably should. Yeah. So, In what what uh, with your name? What um, nationality is that? So the ethnicity, ethnicity. is, is Went, uh, which is a Slavic minority of Eastern Germany. Oh, I've got wow. a whole bunch of Slav on me. Whole bunch really? on both sides of the family. Yeah, um, <coughs> on my uh, on my paternal grandfather's side, which is where my name comes from, um, the Simax immigrated in the in the late eighteen hundreds. That's cutting out kind of weird. Are are you getting that? Yeah, you just got to be right up on it. Yeah, so I'll, I'll make sure I 
Get yep. right up on that microphone. Get on it. I turned your volume up. So, so. Okay. <laughs> it was switching back and forth on the left and right channel. It's young Henry on the... I did not on these. Oh, okay. We've oh, because you've got the good headphones. Henry has to also learn how to talk into the mic. Um, <coughs> we, we're, uh, we're, we, got, we got young Henry here on the, uh, <laughs> on the mixer board, and we're testing out. Tier gets to be kind of the test dummy on the, uh, on the podcast. Yeah. We need carpet in here, so when Henry's walking around looking at his cameras, it doesn't sound like he's river dancing. In the oh, he's got the he's got his logger too. boots yeah. on. I'm about taking my boots off. We got slippers on. Yeah, he's ready to go. All right, you're good. Chop when you when trees. you talk when you talk, Henry, you got to get right up on that. Is that good? Oh it's, man, much better. Listen yeah. to that crisp voice. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's raspy. Yeah, I was gonna sing, but so good. So yeah. where where's where's your fam your family's Slavic you said yeah Slavic German I, I'm a big mix of Europe okay um, but that name specifically comes from uh, my, yeah. my German side they uh they there was a large German immigration to Texas in the late 1800s sponsored by the Methodist Church and that's where that side of the family comes from okay yeah um, <clears throat> yeah big big family there the only thing that was in Crawford Texas prior to the Bush Ranch was my my family reunion. Really? Yeah. Yep. The Simac family reunion. Simac. So is that where you grew up? Nope. Nope. I'm from Oregon. So, um, my grandpa and his next older brother, they were the youngest of seven brothers and sisters. Um, when world war two ended, my great uncle Bill was stationed in, on the Oregon coast. He was in the Navy, uh, after having a couple ships shot out from under him in the Pacific. Wow. Yeah. Um, so he was part of the coastal defense. And that was in World War II? Mm hmm Yep. And then the youngest, uh, in the family was my grandpa, who was a paratrooper who ended up in, uh, the army of occupation in Japan. He was sailing to Japan when, when they surrendered. He likes to say that, uh, they heard he was coming. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Holy shit. Yeah. <clears throat> And, so uh, they were getting ready to put boots on the ground. Yeah. So he was a he was a paratrooper, um, an airborne truck driver, and uh, they hit his whole um, his whole unit. They were the reason they were sailing over was to do uh, aerial resupplies and airborne resupplies for for a ground assault in Japan. Wow. That never happened. But he did spend eighteen months in Japan and um, was injured after the surrender. Um, Got a got a Purple Heart after the surrender. How? And, how? Uh, in his words, he ran over an IED. That w- and that that's his words to me. An IED. So I don't know if that was a a landmine or an actual improvised explosive device, but in Japan. Mm-hmm. So yeah. they were preparing. Sounds like they were preparing. It th- must have been like their shorelines or their points well, of entry. So the thing is, uh, just because a government surrenders doesn't necessarily mean all the people surrender. That's been my, my experience in the last 20 years of yeah. warfare. Yeah. Um, so it, it very well could have been hostile action, not just something left behind. I mean, I would think that's it would have had to have been what it was because he was in Japan. It's not like, yeah, you know, there was something left behind. I guess I didn't know. Not that I'm a World War II history buff, but I guess I didn't know that we ever really got any boots on the ground at all there. Yeah, we occupied Japan. Um, Japan, uh, in my opinion anyway, is economically the country it is today because of the infrastructure we helped build. Post, I mean, I know we have our base there and stuff. I guess I never really thought of it with, <clears throat> I never really thought of it like just immediately following the war. And I guess I never really even like thought about how how did we end up with a base there like obviously we would have had to have had soldiers on the ground at that it's not like they're going to let us come in later right <clears throat> that's not something you really hear about like yeah that part the like, after the after part yep yeah yeah i'm i'm really fortunate to have um i'm the only person in the family who's ever talked to about a service and it didn't all come out at once mm-hmm. he just gradually started telling me things like i i would come back from Baghdad or Iraq or Yemen or wherever it was, whatever unsavory place I, I was, I'd, I'd come back and he would just sit down. You know, he's very chore oriented. He has to have something to do. And mm-hmm. he'd come in from whatever chore he was doing outside, sit at the, at the breakfast table, just him and I, and he would say something random like, you know, I was in a coma for two months. Really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
That's what happened after he hit that IED. He was in a coma for two months. Really? Yeah. And then he would, you know, I would kind of look at him like, where did that come from? And hopefully get something else. But then he'd just get up and go do chores again. Really? And, um, this, uh, this last April, um, a nonprofit in Texas called Life, Lim- Life and Liberty Outdoors called me up and uh, asked if they could take him on a hunt because they do wounded vet hunts. Yeah. Jason Tabansky uh, hooked that up, Mm -hmm. which was awesome. Um, And him being 93, I helped him get there. Yeah. Um, But while we were there, because there was a father and son uh, wounded vet pair that was hunting, Um, dad was a Purple Heart recipient in Vietnam, son was Purple Heart in Iraq. Um, I was in Afghanistan, but never wounded. Yeah. Um, and then my grandpa in World War II, they, they had uh, somebody from a local news affiliate come out. And he was getting, uh, he was interviewing a little bit, but hadn't really talked to my grandpa much. Um, and uh, collected a lot of B-roll, shot a bunch of footage of, of the animals out there. It was high fence. Mm-hmm. And uh, high fence exotics. Mm-hmm. And uh, I sat my grandpa down uh, at, the, at the kitchen table there in the lodge I motioned for the guy to come over and I just put the microphone in front of him and kind of, you know, pantomimed to the, <laughs> to the video yeah. guy. I'm like, does it sound good? And he's like, yeah. And I interviewed my grandpa start to finish about his service from enlisting when he was 17 to going through airborne training to the boat over to Japan. Really? To being in the army of occupation and, uh, you know, him seeing Nagasaki and, and Hiroshima yeah. and his feelings on war in general, which he's never ever talked about before and how he ended up in Oregon, which is when he woke up from that coma, he got back on a boat to the, to the United States, got discharged in t- at a camp that's no longer there in San Francisco. And every, uh, every train and bus back to Texas was full. So he took one to Oregon where, where his brother was. Really? Yeah. And that's, that's how he ended up being from Oregon instead of Texas. So when you were <laughs> interviewing him on that, he, <clears throat> he pretty well opened up and kind of, yeah. Yeah, more than he has in his entire lifetime. Are you going to put that out as a podcast? Or? Well, I don't own it. The, that local news affiliate owns it. But I did let him know that... Uh, you got to get that audio. He sent it to me. I have it, mm-hmm. but I don't own it. Yeah, right. But I did let him know that the Library of Congress uh, is is hungry for things like this because those stories are... Yeah. We're losing them. <clears throat> it's, a, it's kind of unfortunate podcast didn't become the thing they are today. You right. know, I mean, obviously podcasts have been around for a while, but now <clears throat> every Tom, Dick and Harry and knife maker. And I have one now. Yeah. We all, everybody has, yeah. everybody has one. I didn't want one, <coughs> but I have one now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's too bad that, I mean, you know, we've lost not all, but most of our world war two vets, especially right. just in the last five to 10 years. Right. Um, it would be, it's super unfortunate that we didn't get a chance to record more of those people's stories, but I think we need to double down on that with like the Vietnam vets. Mm-hmm. Um, try and get those guys, the ones that are willing to, to talk. Yeah. And, and priority to them because again, I mean, it's people die, people, mm-hmm. you know, age out. We got to get those stories um, curated. Yeah. But I also think it's, it's, e- equally as important for the GWAT generation to tell uh, their story, um, their stories, because it's, they're going to fade. And I, you know, I've, I've written some of mine down, but I'm, I'm fearful of how much I've forgotten because that has been just such a part of my everyday life over the last 20 whatever years. Yeah. You know, there's, there's been times where, uh, there's a good friend of mine, a teammate of mine when I was with Blackwater. Um, we were, we were having drinks with, uh, Chris Hunt in Park City. Yeah. And he started telling a story. I'm like, what, what, is, who are you talking about? He goes, you. <laughs> I was like, really? what? I did that. He's like, yeah. I'm like, oh shit. I didn't know. Yeah. I didn't remember that. Well, and there's also kind of this, I don't know if it's a stigma or what you want to call it, but <clears throat> you know, a lot of veterans don't like it when other veterans are telling stories or writing books or doing that stuff because true. Yeah. you've got this this whole like it's about the team or it's about 
you know, the mission and it's not about the individual. So, <clears throat> you know, there's a guy out telling a story on a podcast mm-hmm. and he got a whole bunch of other veterans shitting on him saying, you know, that guy shouldn't be telling that. And obviously there's ways that you could, you could sit here and tell stories and say, I am me all night long if you want. Yeah. I mean, there's obviously a way to tell stories that are, wh- whether they're funny or they're powerful or, or there's something to learn from them because let's face it. Um, we seem to be making the mistakes. You know, my history teacher in high school always said, you know, history repeats itself. Mm -hmm. Well, Afghanistan looks... And you repeated history. (laughs) Yeah, no shit. (laughs) Uh, But Afghanistan looks a lot like Vietnam from the standpoint of we went there and fought and... It also looks a lot like Afghanistan with the Russians. Yes, Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, it's... uh, at some point you would hope by hearing a lot of these stories, somebody in the future might say, I think I've seen this playbook before. Yeah. Um, maybe we shouldn't try and do it this way or. Yeah. That's um, <clears throat> veterans eat their own. And man, my community, I think we're the worst at it. When I say my community, I mean, I mean, Greenbury specifically because we, we pride ourselves on being quite professionals. And so when somebody with a special forces tab um, sits in front of a microphone or sits down in front of a keyboard and writes something, uh, it's an instant red flag. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm kind of surprised I haven't been canceled over it. Um, maybe it's maybe it's coming. It is. It, I'm sure it is. Um, <laughs> but, but we eat our own, and it's, it's, un, it's unfortunate. Uh, some of it is generational because uh, not every, not every Greenberg is the same. I mean, not every Greenberg generation is the same. Um, but some of it is just chip on the shoulder, Everything's, everything's a secret. Um, you know, we only we keep it in the team room, et cetera, so forth. The problem with that thinking um, is that there's a different there's a there's a difference between opsec, um, which is short for operational security. There's a difference between opsec and quiet professionalizing ourselves to death. Mm-hmm. We we the stories have to be there has to be some lore out there mm-hmm. aside from Rambo um, you know and John Wayne there there has to be that out there or who's going to backfill us right people have to know at least know what special forces is and be somewhat interested or nobody's going to try out well how many of the Navy SEALs do you hear talk about the Navy SEAL movies they watched when they were <clears throat> you know in high school or whatever yeah I know Andy know. does yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's especially a big, he's a big fan of that Charlie Sheen movie. <laughs> well, and he really loves Steven Seagal. <laughs> Who doesn't? Casey yeah. Ryback. Man, I mean that's that's the only reason I have any interest in cooking. <laughs> <laughs> what I what I will say about it though, with the telling the stories part, is um, you know, so there, <clears throat> my ex wife's uh, speaking of ex wives, um, she wasn't quite as crazy as it sounds like your ex wife. Uh, but my ex-wife, her dad was in Vietnam, mm-hmm. and um, I'd say our relationship is just somewhat business. I mean, we say hi or whatever when we pass at a football game or whatever for the kids. But <clears throat> I asked him this uh, track season, and I didn't have this podcast studio set up, and so it didn't happen this year, and they're now down south for the winter. So hopefully this will happen in the spring. But I asked him this spring, I kind of caught him at a football or at a track game. We were kind of track meet. We were out in the middle of the field, just kind of him and I. And I said, Hey, I, you know, he's never really talked to people much about his Vietnam stuff, Mm -hmm. um, his service there. And, you know, he's told his son just a little bit, but I mean, his son's, you know, 50, 52 years old. Right. Um, and he's told him next to nothing. And, uh, so I caught him and I said, hey, you're not getting any younger. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, you're not getting any younger. Um, there's going to come a time someday when, you know, and he's got, what, six grandkids. Mm-hmm. And there's going to come a time someday when, you know, my son Hank is 35, 40, <clears throat> more in touch with, like, wanting to know where his past comes from and whatnot. <coughs> Sorry. Need some I don't of that brown medicine right there. Yeah, and I don't have my cough button. Uh, that's a that's a flaw with the way we have it set up. It's over there in front of Henry. I can't hit my little cough. Uh, I told him I said, I think we need to sit down, and I want to record 
you know, from the beginning of your life all the way on through and, and including your service. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'll agree not to post it, not to put it online, not to whatever. Like I, I even told him, I said, you tell me how old you want the kids to be. If it's 25 or it's 30 or whatever that number is, but someday there should be a recording that they can sit down and listen to their grandpa talk about when he was 10 years old and when he was 20 years old right. and when he was in the middle of Vietnam and yep. all of that. And, uh, you know, quite frankly, like the podcast we're doing now and most all of these podcasts are going to kind of disappear into podcast oblivion and nobody's really going to care in another 20 years. Right. But there's a good chance that you might have a grandson someday that you may never even meet potentially Googling and looking for every single thing that his grandpa ever recorded and want to go back and listen to it. And, you know, that's, that could be in another 20, 30, 40 years from now. And the whole Iraq, Afghanistan, all this period in time that's so fresh to us is just a piece of history, just like Vietnam and World War II. And it happens fast. I think um, further down the road, even though there is such an, abundance uh, just a sea of podcasts i think that the ones that tell uh stories and and share the human experience i think those are going to be the ones that last and i don't necessarily mean right now i mean those are the, those are the things that people are going to want to listen to 20 years from now like the john striker meyer ones that he did with jocko like yeah. across the fence i mean when i listened to those i was i couldn't stop listening right and then he did, I think, uh, Doug Letourneau, the Frenchman. Um, uh, he had a couple. He had, a, I think, a King Bee pilot on. And, I mean, stories were like, even Jocko, with everything that Jocko's been through and what he's seen in war, Jocko's sitting there going, holy shit. Like, that can't even be true. Like, right? are you serious? And, you know, stuff that's completely blows away someone who's seen some stuff and done some stuff. Yeah. Um, those kind of podcasts, like, I don't know how many people I've told about those, like, man, you know, there's a reason a lot of these Vietnam vets don't want to talk about that stuff because like, even when he talks about, I mean, the darkness in those jungles. Yeah. It's, <clears throat> I, I mean, I can speak to some of that. It's, that's why I started writing was to, it, well, I mean, it was by accident, but I had a lot of stuff that I wasn't dealing with mm -hmm. and I, I found out when I. I had to write something for an English paper in, in college. And uh, I wrote about a particularly impactful experience in Afghanistan that had to do with, uh, with the casualty that I was treating. And I found that cathartic, and I found it healing. Mm -hmm. um, and so I started, like, that's, that's how I started writing. But for a lot of people that, I mean, that's pulling off a scab where there's a fresh wound underneath. And it's just been festering for as many years as they've let it. The nice thing I would think about writing is you can stop when it's getting to be too much and walk away from it and then come back when you're ready and nobody's pressuring you or you can sit and think about one thought that you want to try and get out the way you want to get out. Like in a podcast, you're kind of somewhat being pressured, asked, pushed along. Um, and I think also being videoed, I think it's different when you're probably writing about on paper versus sitting there on a video. Yeah. I mean, especially even if you're, you know, get to a point where you're shedding a tear, <clears throat> you know, you probably hold back more on a, on a video type podcast Definitely. than you would writing something in, yeah. in yeah, your house. 100%. Yeah. Excuse me. I've never stopped writing because it was, it was too much that it's, uh, it's, it's one of those, it hurts good type things like. Like when you've got, like when you've got like a, a loose tooth, mm -hmm. and and you're just kind of grinding on it, and you can you can you can taste the blood in your mouth from from it cutting your gums, but you, you can't stop. You just keep going. Yeah, yeah, and you know you're making progress. I mean, you're yeah, you're slowly getting through it. Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely something that I think people should. Even if they know, like if there's veterans out there that they know somebody that they trust that's got a podcast or something, <clears throat> even if you don't necessarily want it to be posted, just to go through the interview process and get it recorded mm -hmm. for your family for later. Yeah. 
and I'd be willing to do that. I mean, I've got my recording equipment down there in your mudroom right now. I've paired it down to a small handgun case. Right. You know, I don't have a young Henry or cameras and whatnot, but I've got a little mixer and a couple mics and a couple of headphones. I'm, and I, everything I do is mobile and face to face. So mm-hmm. if anybody out there wants to share their story, I'm, I'm down to record it. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's important for sure. Um, <coughs> dang. Freaking can't get my throat clear. Uh, speaking of Jocko, <coughs> did I, did, does he listen to your podcast? Oh, I'm sure he does. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> so he's always to... texting me, asking me when I'm going <laughs> to drop a new one. The last one I dropped, I need to look. Henry, Google this. <laughs> I've always wanted to do that. <laughs> when was the last time I dropped a podcast? So while he's calling that up. See, he's already <clears> slower <throat> than Jamie. Jamie would have had it. I don't think I told you this. So uh, Total Archer Challenge, Big Sky. Um, I wander into the the bar area right there, and uh, Jocko is, is standing there, and people have surrounded him. Yeah. You know, that... He's he's gathered in orbit the way the way he does. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I know I know a few of the people standing there, but I don't think anybody. I've met probably a third of the people standing in that circle at some point. I don't think anybody actually knows who I am unless I'm standing next to Evan. Yeah, <coughs> and even then, it's like, oh, that's the guy standing next to Evan. So I walked up to Jocko, who I've met before, and I said, uh, "Excuse me." Uh, he goes, "Yeah." He's super friendly. I said, "Are you? Are you Marcus Luttrell?" He goes, no, <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> and Did you start laughing? No, I just, I, I played it stone cold and Leaf, Leaf looked offended. He's like, ah, that, that's Jocko. That's <laughs> Mark. That's, that's Jocko. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and Evan was standing there? No, Evan wasn't oh. there. <laughs> he does gather an orbit. It is crazy. He does, yeah. Uh, we were just standing there talking like in the. Um, area between the tents. Yeah. And him and I start talking, and then the next thing you know, and then people are, like, incredibly rude. Like, they come in, we were talking about something, and then they just, they just step in the middle. Yeah. And that, that part of it would, like, if I was him, that would, and, you know, not that it mattered to him that he was talking to me, but it would, like, bother me. and be like, hey, like, I'm talking to this guy, but he handles it well. But he I does. Mean, it yeah, is. I've seen that, too. Um. And he's nowhere near the celebrity that a lot of celebrities are. Mm-hmm. And I thought, man, if he has to deal with that, what is what do all these like super super famous people have to deal with? It's crazy. Well, I can tell you, it's not easy. <clears throat> yeah, um, I've, I've I've got over eighteen thousand followers now. You're creeping up there. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's. it's are you gonna be like Isaac Aylman and you start purging them? He says I delete followers. <laughs> um, no, but I will <laughs> restrict people in comments if they get. Sometimes there's there, there's some there's some creative comments. And they're not necessarily insulting. Yeah, they're just like Are they generally from fellow veterans or some of them. Yeah, yeah, or people claiming to be veterans. Right, and some people just arbitrarily start fighting in the comments about about things that don't matter. And it's not with me. It's about it's with other people in the comments, and uh, it's it's just the internet's a strange place. It is amazing. Um, it's amazing how much time spe- people spend on the internet fighting with each other. Yeah. As if I could care less what John 1723 underscore seven has to say. Less that are the Green Bay Packers. I think that's what that is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Don't you know, said by each. When's the last podcast I dropped? Okay. So I'm not slow here. The internet is slow. Uh, oh. This podcast is very unsearchable. Oh. <laughs> So that gives me a blank. <laughs> no. Let me show you what Spotify gives me. <coughs> the Josh Smith show. Oh, I put you're Josh not even pot. This is the first Josh Smith show. No, you're supposed to search <laughs> the Josh Smith show. <laughs> like, Henry doesn't even know what the name of our own podcast is. <laughs> Go to a- June 27th is the last one on Apple. June 27th of last year? Can't be of this year. Let's see here. This is quality content. And what is it on? No, is I don't even Spotify? know what that is. Josh Smith. Oh no, you're looking at you're looking at podcasts I've been on. What is that an iPhone 12? I'm just searching. What are you a poor? Jeez. Are you a poor? That's like a. 
you know, we're gonna have to. That might be a little wrong. <laughs> we're gonna have to. Okay, Josh, uh, I got it now. Yeah, going if slow. you if but you it's still going slow. If you search the right name of the podcast, August, August twenty twenty one. Seriously, with Will Stelter. It's been a year and a half since you've laid down some fat tracks. It's true. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's the last one. Yeah, because the veteran forging weekend was. Yeah, that same that same weekend. Well, that's I feel wild. honored. That's yeah. So, I had my podcast studio set up in my shop over there on this table, and that was the point we had two employees, mm-hmm. and they only came like two days a week, and so I would just do my podcast on the days they weren't there. Yeah, and that was about the time. Yeah, that was the uh, that was the year. That was the first year that I was like full time at this, because I quit my job in January first of that year. So by August we did the veteran thing, mm-hmm. but then it was starting to get busy enough where I, and so I my podcast stuff was kind of in the way, and I put it in the basement, and then I recorded like four others I never posted. <laughs> I have <coughs> twelve in the bank. I'm 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 doing everything as a one man show. So yeah, I've never edited before. It's gonna be rough. I, yeah. I have to accept that this is going to be a learning process and just put it out there. Because that's I where have I'm hoping. Stuff. That's where I'm hoping Henry helps out. I'm just hoping, though, he puts the right name of the show on the show. I might I might ask young Henry to give me some assistance. Absolutely. Yeah, we'll, we'll put him on the spot right out, here so know. he can't say no. We'll see how the rest <laughs> of this goes. <laughs> so, um, veteran it's, service. It's called so allegedly, I'm, by the way. I I kept waiting for you to ask. Oh, oh no, I was going to ask what's later. Your name? I was going to ask. Stop taking my questions away. Oh, I only oh have sorry. Like you, only have a, you only have a couple. <laughs> yeah, there goes one. It's thirty percent <laughs> of my podcast gone. Uh, and your Instagram handle was the other one. So you only got to answer that, that now. Or no, no, you no, got to ask. Got to save it. You got to ask it. To, yeah. Don't, have you ever done one of these? No, it's first time. Stop answering the questions before I ask them. Where did you you so you grew up in Oregon? I did. What. Um, did you play sports in high school? Uh, vaguely. I would say I, I, I was on sports teams. Okay. I wasn't very, uh, adept or competitive. Really? Yeah. Yeah. My first organized sport outside of, you know, six years old playing soccer. Yeah. Uh, I ran cross country my freshman year. Okay. Which, um, I'm in hindsight, I'm very, very glad I did it, but that is not, I'm, I'm not a natural gazelle. By that's, hard, that's hard to believe. I, I, just, I mean, look at this. I mean, you would think I'd be out there doing Steve Pro, Prefontaine, whatnot. I have seen you gazelle your way up a mountain, um, but we'll, and we'll get into that. <laughs> yeah. I think that was less of, that was like a, a, a three-legged gazelle maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was impressive. So, <laughs> yeah. so. Uh, sports weren't a big thing, and I you we actually went and watched my boy play basketball tonight. Mm-hmm. And you were telling me when we were sitting there that at that point in your life, like freshman year, eighth grade year, you were I was small, just a little guy. Yeah, yeah, I was small. I was a uh, yeah. I am. Um, I was. I was so proud of myself at the end of eighth grade when I when I was in the triple digits for weight. Yeah, I was a. Uh, I was one hundred and four pounds. Yeah, I'm just barely over five foot when I uh, when I graduated the eighth grade, and then when I did my sports physical for cross country the next year, um, I was five seven one thirty five. That was a so you were getting after. That it. was a busy summer. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So so um, and for people who aren't watching, who are just listening, like you're a pretty big dude now. I mean, you're pretty good size as far as like yeah. stocky, well built, two strong dude, thirty three, thirty five, somewhere in there. I yeah. would have. I would have taken fifteen off just for you. I didn't like a. <laughs> I'm an honest like broker. Trimmed up two hundred five. I believe in authenticity. I haven't been two hundred five since Sears School. Really? Yeah, I went from two nineteen to one ninety one in nineteen days. No shit. That's a that's a weight loss program right there. Keto? Do they do keto? Uh, they, they do. Yeah, it's uh, you're restricted to whatever you can uh, kill or forage. Dig up. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's the ultimate keto diet. Yeah. <laughs> so what? Uh, Coming out of high school, did you join the military, the army, right off the bat? No, absolutely not. No. What'd you do? No, I um, I was the last person anybody expected to join the military in high school. In fact, I remember doing an article for the uh, high school 
paper where I, I gathered everybody that was joining out of high school uh, to do basically a group interview, but it was not journal. It was like CNN journalism. Like, yeah, you guys are, you had an angle. I did. I did. You I had your piece an angle. Of shit. Yeah. Yeah. What was your <clears throat> thought of that at that time, at that stage in your life, at that age, what was your thought of those kids going into the military? Um, I thought they were just headed down the wrong path. Honestly, was that was that a way that you were raised? Is that something that came from oh, your parents? A little bit, definitely not my my birth dad, and it's not that um, it's not that my stepdad and my my mom hated the military, but um, they were Quakers. Okay, and my stepdad was a Quaker pastor, so we went to a friend's church, and I was a pastor's kid. And one of the basic tenets of of the friend's church is is that it's pacifism. Okay. So uh, I had zero interest in doing anything that involved violence. So as a kid growing up, were you pretty down the Quaker rabbit hole? I mean, were you buying in as a kid to what your parents were selling? Yeah, yeah. Yep. What was that like? Um, What was your childhood like growing up, like, with Quaker parents? So that was mostly junior high, high school uh, age. Because my growing up with my dad and my stepmom was... Basically, completely the opposite. My my dad, my, my birth dad, um, had me convinced that he was a ninja until I was about 12. Um, I see nothing wrong with that. And we actually, and this, you know, looking back on it, I, I, I kind of poo-pooed this until I, I told Jeff Kirkham about this years ago, and he goes, that's awesome. I wish my dad had done that. Because yeah. we were actually running through the West Hills of Portland when I was about eight years old in ninja geese, hood, Katanas, the whole bit, showing throwing shurikens at trees. No early shit. Early morning on Saturdays. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hey, at least you had all kinds of confidence. And <laughs> yes. um, I also it's see how wild. you later on married a crazy person. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but you can see, I mean, I've got a, a ninja, former stripper on this side, and then I've got a uh, artist, uh, Quaker pastor Quaker. On, this, on this side. So very two, two very different uh, father figures. So how did it, how was the transition for you? And you say that was like that junior high age, what, like 12, 13, 14, when like you went from being a ninja to a Quaker? Yeah, that was, I would say, I mean, it was. That's a hard turn. Yeah, because everything is changing then, right? I mean, you got adolescence and and value changes and it was. Did you find, was that rough? I mean, was it difficult? I think adolescence is rough for everybody, but. Yeah. Um, we were also living on a Quaker pastor's salary, which if I remember right, was $500 a month. So <clears throat> it wasn't exa- exactly, uh, buying, buying the, the latest and greatest fly kicks and whatnot either. Yeah. Yeah. Were you helping farm and doing that kind of stuff or? No, uh, not for my parents. So, um, the, there, he was an assistant pastor at a deaf church, um, in Salem, Oregon. Uh, and, uh, which lended itself to its own unique experiences. Yeah. Being one of the only people that can hear when everybody's making a joyful noise. Yeah. <laughs> and they do sing. We're the hymns. Uh, oh man. If you want to get canceled, I'll do an impersonation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, um, when he got his own, um, his own church, he was, uh, he was a pastor of a small church that had been around since the late 1800s in Marion, Oregon. The town wasn't even incorporated uh, hmm. in the Willamette Valley. It's kind of between um, Salem and uh, Albany and, and uh, Staten. And out there, I went to a three-year high school in the middle of three corn three cornfields and switching schools, um, being a new kid when everybody has grown up around each other. Yeah. You know, that was, that, that had its challenges and then, you know, being... Actually, being a pastor's kid in a smaller community like that isn't isn't. There's nothing really rough about that, but turning the other cheek to bullies is is right. Yeah. So you're writing this article about these these kids going into the military. Yeah, I don't remember what I said, but I I I found it a few years ago, and I was like, man, what an asshole. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> well, just your perspective as a what seventeen eighteen year old. Yeah. Um raised up in, in your own little sheltered. And that's know, exactly what house. it was. I was, I was sheltered. Yeah. yeah. 
So yep. what did you do after high school then before military? Um, I, um, I was accepted into a limited entry journalism program for University of Oregon. Um, and I, uh, I went to that for about half a term before dropping out to work in Mount Hood. You I were really close to becoming like a super liberal journalist. Yeah. I mean, University of Oregon, I mean, that's uh, Eugene. Mm-hmm. It's like. Now, I wasn't going to Eugene because I picked my schools. I only wanted to either go to Central Oregon community or Mount Hood community because of the proximity to the mountains. I used to do a knife show there in Eugene every single year in April, and we would stay in the campus inn right across from cam- uh, the campus right, there. Yeah. And there was an IHOP across the street, and usually around 1, the vampires would come out for their pancakes. And it was amazing. Coming from a small <laughs> sheltered town in <laughs> Montana, uh, there was definitely things that I saw. And back then it wasn't. Like, well, there was no social media, and it wasn't cool to be seen in the daylight dressed in the way they were dressed. But, boy, between 1 and 5 a.m., it was, uh, the IHOP was the place to be for people watching for a small-town Montana kid. I can tell you that. I was in a Denny's. uh, This is a very long time ago, but I was in a Denny's on acid (laughs) at, like, 2 in the morning. And I looked around, and I think this was the first time I'd ever been on acid and uh, I looked around and I was convinced that everybody in our section which was a smoking section we decided to sit it was split in half we decided to sit in the smoking section that time because that's where that's where life happened that's that's where everything yeah. that's where all the cool kids were yeah I, I was convinced that everybody around me was gay I could <laughs> see it I could see that everybody in Denny's on, on the smoking side was gay, and I don't know what I thought was going to happen, but I had to tug on a on a sleeve and say, "Hey, <laughs> we got to go." <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it funny too? I was actually I was actually telling my kids about smoking sections the other day. Yeah, is that you would walk into Denny's or any other restaurant, smoking or non-smoking, and you would tell them, and say non-smoking, and they'd take you down and they'd sit you down, and then smoking section. They take that person and walk them down the other aisle and sit them literally directly next to them, and there'd be like a eighteen inch tall piece of glass that yeah separated that the smoke you, just kind of the smoke just whisks over. over the top <laughs> <laughs> yeah in your area. Would you like your smoking on your food or just lightly sprinkled over? Yeah, yeah. just hovering around the top, just hovering. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what was the what what was the big change in like the thought process or what, like how, how did the military, how did all of a sudden you go from writing articles about the weirdos oh, yeah. going into it? Well, I got slapped in the face with, with a, a huge dose of life is what happened. Okay. So <clears throat> I got my girlfriend pregnant and when the snow melted, I didn't have money to go back to school. So I needed uh, medical benefits and I needed college money. And I was, I was willing to uh, forego my values yeah. To, <laughs> for that. Um, and I didn't know anything about the military at all, except that Marines fought dragons and played chess. Yeah. On, on TV commercials. So that's the, that's where I tried to go first. What I did know is the coolest job on Mount hood was a snowcat operator. Yeah. Yeah. So I decided I was going to drive tanks. Okay. Because I figure if, if I could drive a tank when I get out of the army, yeah, of course they'll they'll hire me back, and you can bomb the avalanches. Yeah, that's I mean, it makes perfect sense. Yeah, there was I had a whole five year life plan. So the Marines uh, were full. They absolutely were not full. They were excited to take me, very eager, uh, but they also wanted me to commit to six years for oh. that job. And at the time, I thought, wow, six years, I'll be twenty four. Yeah, life's when I basically get out, over. It's point. over. Uh, I'll be ready to collect social security. <laughs> yeah. Um, I might be on a cane. Who who knows? I mean, I will be a geriatric when I get out of the Marine Corps. And the Army was willing to give me the same job for two years and twenty thousand for school. Nice. And I hear I am twenty seven years later. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> did you make the right choice? <laughs> yeah. Take that Army. Show yeah. you. Give me a two year contract. <laughs> um, did I make the right choice? Well, there was a lot of choices between then and now and I've some of them have been the right choice and yeah many of them have not yeah yeah so with uh 
with that, when you go into the recruiter's office, do they give you, um, did you, did they give you some job choices you would, you could try and go towards? Yeah. So I took my, uh, ASVAB and, um, the army recruiter said I could have any job in the army I wanted. And I said, I want to drive tanks. Oh, in general. And he kind of <laughs> puppy cocked his head sideways. and said, he goes, are you sure? You can have any job in the army you want. I said, yeah, I want to drive tanks. He's like, okay. <laughs> yeah. Which is um, a, a good illustration of how you can be intelligent but not smart. Yeah. Yeah. No, 100%. That's interesting, actually. And it, it's kind of too bad you would hope that maybe there would be somewhat of a recruiter slash somewhat father figure that would be like, look, son. Yeah. Let's let's talk about this a little longer instead of just like sweet fill in the quota yeah, today. Like, what are your plans after the military? <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, you want to bomb snow banks? Let's talk about this a little bit more. Well, maybe I did tell him that and he's like, Yeah, none of this is relevant. <laughs> Doesn't matter. This kid's this yeah. dude's gonna be a ski bum for life. Yeah. He's lucky he's getting this. How old were you when you signed up then? Eighteen. So you got your girlfriend pregnant at eighteen. Yeah. Damn. Yeah. That's why I have two adult children. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. What, uh, so did you just head straight to basic training at that point? Or? I, had a, I had a few months. So um, spring conditions went into effect at uh, Mount Hood. It started laying people off. Um, I signed my paperwork in February, and I didn't ship out till May. So I actually, I packed trucks for RPS in Portland for a little bit. Uh, RPS turned into FedEx Ground. Mm-hmm. later on but uh, back then it was called roadway package you're systems. older than fedex <laughs> fedex ground oh okay yeah let's get let's get it straight yeah yeah but that was a grueling job um it was only five hour shifts but there weren't breaks and it was like playing you had a, a truck trailer with a list of zip codes on it and packages coming down a conveyor belt you had to pick them up make sure it was the right zip code and this i'm working graveyard so you're half zombie anyway yeah and they don't stop there's a lot of them in eugene uh zombies yeah 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 that's the northwest in general now a lot of zombies um but they they don't stop they just keep coming it's kind of like that uh, old i love lucy where they're on the they're packaging the chocolates and they just keep coming and they're trying to oh yeah yeah but you've got a you've got to play tetris with these things too and pack the truck in a way that those packages aren't going to fall over that was a, that was a grueling job. Hmm. Yeah, it was only five hour shift, but it was five hours straight, yeah. middle of night. Now, when you signed up, what year was that? Ninety five. So I mean, the status of the world at that point is pretty. I mean, there uh, wasn't what was what, going what on. What was in going 95? on? Um, the army was doing rotations to Kuwait uh, at the time, which uh, I had Desert Storms over at this Desert point. Storms over. Yeah, it's uh, it's Clinton era. Mm-hmm. So the army really doesn't have a budget anyway. Yeah. Um, hey, did you have any thought when you really signed up as a kid at that age, like going to war or no. was it more of just like, I'm going to just get these benefits and no, I was in it for me. Yeah. hundred percent in it for me. Um, but I was a, I started out being a decent family guy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and when I got through, uh, Fort Knox, I actually almost got kicked out, uh, based on a clerical error on some of my paperwork. How's that? Well, <clears throat> they said I got called into uh, the orderly room and was being told that uh, I was being chaptered out for a fraudulent enlistment. And I was like, well, Sergeant, what does that mean? It's like, it means you lied on your on your enlistment paperwork. I'm like, what? <laughs> I had no idea what I lied about. Uh, so I started inventing things that I might have lied about. I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, so uh, they didn't give me feedback initially on that. They just said, yeah, you're, you're going to go home. Well, I decided I was going to go on my own terms. So I, uh, I called my, my wife. I got married right before I went to basic when I was 19. And um, I, I told her that I was going, I told her what was going on and um, that I was going to um, claim conscientious objector. Oh, really? Which based on my upbringing. Yeah. I you had, can win that. I'd, yeah, I had pretty ground, good grounds for her. Yeah. And so I told my platoon sergeant, and he's like, oh. <laughs> you can just kind of <laughs> see that. 
<laughs> like the light go out in his eyes. I go, oh. <laughs> so that's a good. Did somebody tell you about that? That's a pretty good. I knew uh, about it because I grew up as a Quaker. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a good move. <laughs> well played. Yeah, the Friends Church is actually. I mean, they they're they have a a long history of social activism. Um, some of it better than others, and we can let's come back to that. Yeah. Is that there's an interesting point in my my life where that comes up again. Um, but like they were active in uh, the Underground Railroad both in, in manning safe houses and being conductors, I think. And, mm. um, at one point, uh, it was called the Indian Affairs Bureau. I yeah, think that's Bureau, what it's called. Bureau of Indian Bureau Affairs. Bureau of Indian Affairs, yeah. Mm. The Quaker Church was heavily involved in staffing that because the government was failing. Right. Uh, imagine that. Yeah. Yeah. So, <coughs> long history of, of social activism. Uh, some of it good, some of it, eh. Um. But, uh, yeah, I definitely had the background to, to make that stick. Yeah. So I, um, I'm thinking, okay, this is the plan. I'm going to go home. I'm actually, I mean, I'm a little bummed that I'm not going to get the GI Bill. But mm-hmm. I'm really stoked to go hang out with my, my wife. Yeah. And, uh, and I don't know. I guess I'm going to go back to swinging hammers because I'm the only guy in my family that's not a general contractor. And uh, that's, that's the plan. I walk into the company orderly office and um, my <laughs> the company commander's in there and uh, the platoon sergeant knocks on his door and the CEO's like, uh, who is it? <laughs> and the, 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 platoon, the platoon sergeant goes, it's, uh, it's Cymac. <laughs> commander's like, what does he want? He's like, he must be a conscious objector. <laughs> the commander, I never even got to see the commander. He goes, his door's open. He goes, Bullshit. <laughs> it's like, he's not getting, he's not going to get out on that. <laughs> it did. So the fraudulent enlistment thing was a clerical error. Somebody in the recruitment office or whatever, MEPS somewhere had put the wrong date on a speeding ticket. And somebody somewhere decided that was enough to be a fraudulent enlistment. Even though I'd reported the speeding ticket, it was the wrong date. So oh my God. It flagged me for fraudulent enlistment. Jeez. So the whole thing got thrown out, and I ended up finishing OSET, became a yeah. 19 kilo, and went off to Fort Hood, Texas for the next five years. But when I got to Fort Hood, again, just not really having any interest in going to spend the next six months in Kuwait, right. sweating in uh, 60 tons of depleted uranium and steel, um, the Horse Cavalry Detachment, uh, so they came down to recruit um, new bodies out of the reception battalion. Mm-hmm. And there was a lot of hazing back then, but I didn't know any better because I'm, I'm an E nothing. Yeah. Fresh out of basic training. As far as I knew, the entire army was hazing. Yeah. I didn't know any better. So I knocked out their initial PT test and got yelled at for three days. Got voted into the unit and I spent the next four years riding horses for the army <laughs> instead of riding tanks. Yeah. So <laughs> this kind of leads into a funny story with Tier because we went on a hunt together. Was that? Was that last year? Yeah, last year. This time last <clears throat> yeah. year. Yeah. It was... Uh, a year and a month ago. October. Mm-hmm. Yeah, October of last year. We fly into uh, Selway Wilderness, and we're on this little landing strip. The guide meets us there. Actually, the Wrangler for the outfit meets us there, and yeah. he has some stock. He has a couple mules and some horses, and it's uh, Trevor Thompson and... Um, well, Lacey, Lacey, Lacey was already there. Yeah, she was already there. Long story there. Bad weather, and she got in, and then we didn't. Um, and Mike Clancy and you and I, mm-hmm. and uh, of course, being a horse expert, Tier knew exactly how to answer this. But the the Wrangler asks, "Does anybody have any experience on horses?" And pretty much everybody kind of said the same thing, like "No" or. I was like, well, I've, I've been on them a little bit, but, like, I sit on a horse. I don't ride it. Yeah. Like, I'm not a rider. <laughs> I'm a sitter of a horse. I, I think what I said is, uh, he said, who has the most experience? I said, probably Josh. Yeah, yeah, you I did. I just threw up your name. You did. You just you're from Montana. volunteered me, yeah. <laughs> I've seen Yellowstone. Everybody rides horses. Yeah. And so <laughs> we get on these horses. He puts us on these horses, and we start going along. And Mike Clancy, who's, what is he, 6'4"? 6'4". 6'5". 6'5". And hates horses. Hates horses. And... I mean, I don't even think the horse was really being that bad, but 
Mike's back there kind of bouncing along and he's like, guys, I, I can't do this. Like, and then we'd go a little bit further. We're like, yeah, you're doing fine. And like his knees are all bent because the stirrups aren't long enough. <laughs> and he's bouncing off the back of this horse, just up and down, just jackhammering on this horse. No, no legs in the stirrups, like no, like using your legs as shock absorbers. Yeah. He's just getting kind of None beat. Of it. And then his horse kind of knows that yeah, his horse is he can, over it as well. <laughs> yeah. He can tell that, uh, that the rider that he has on his back does not know what he's doing. Yeah. And, uh, Mike's back there, and finally we get, what is it, probably not even a mile down the trail or so, maybe a mile, and Mike, like, gets off. He's like, I can't do it. I, I'm going to walk. I'm going to walk. I'm going to leave the horse. And so finally you switched, didn't you, at yeah. that point? Tears like, well, I'll, I'll take him. I'll ride him. And I'm not sure at what point. I think it was a couple miles later on the trail you announced that you spent four years in the Calvary <laughs> Division of the army <laughs> riding horses. And then I think you also happened to mention that you won like a bocce ball competition in Afghanistan. B- Buskashi. Buskashi. Yeah. Yeah. Basically. Bocce ball in Afghanistan would be pretty funny as well. But yeah, Buskashi. I won a Buskashi tournament in Afghanistan. Yeah. Tier basically announces after two or three hours into the trip that he is pretty much a full on horse expert <laughs> trainer, but also a new, a new enough to say, to not say anything when the guy asked who who could ride. Yeah. Because, you know, as soon as you say, well, I'm the best rider, they're going to like, well, we got a real dick, yeah. dickhead Take of a this horse piece here. Of shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he, he's not a real big fan of trees and bushes. Other than that, he's Or great. people on his back. <laughs> or, or steep banks. Yeah. <laughs> so, and that was really only where that trip just began. And then it was all... Uh, you could say quite I, the story from there. I thought you were going to say it was all downhill, but it was mostly uphill. It was mostly uphill from there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um. So, h- how did the uh, what What did you do as far as the horse the horse part of the uh, of the army? What was your a lot of shoveling shit? Why? Wh- so yeah. why did the why why does the army have those horses? What um, are they for? Esprit de corps, parades. history, parades, ceremonies. Yeah, but the the bread and butter of of the detachment was this um this half an hour long um. Drill and ceremony and weapons and tactics demonstration that we would do um, with with period weapons and uh, you know 1885 McClellan saddles and 1873 Springfield carbine trapdoor model 4570 weighing 10 pounds four ounces that an expert trooper could fire six rounds in a minute. It's a lot of superfluous, useless information that I remember from yeah <laughs> from back in the day. And everything, I mean, from remember what you were telling us in hunting camp, like everything had to be dialed. I yeah. mean, perfectly. Yeah. Yep. Um, I mean, it, it was a, it was a ceremonial unit. Um, in, in that regard, I mean, Mike Glover and I actually have really similar resumes. Well, cause he was the guard at the tomb of the unknown, yeah, right? Yeah. Which is much better known. And, uh, and I don't want to compare my ceremonial experience to, uh, to his because, uh, guard at the, at, at the tomb of the unknown soldier is a really, really big deal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but does he shovel shit doing that? Uh, no, but they do have a case on detachment there, so the uh, they they do have stables, really in in Arlington, yeah, mm. <clears throat> with that unit because they pull they pull uh, caskets. Oh, okay. Uh, and on occasion, the the unit that I was in the horse detachment in the first cav and the case on detachment will do some cross training and and whatnot. But uh, you you where I was at you. Uh, the pinnacle of service in the horse detachment was to work your way onto the demonstration team, which was 12 people out of the entire detachment. Excuse me. And uh, tryouts were twice a year. And, it, uh, you know, there were, there were perks yeah. to, to being in that. I mean, there was, there was rank in the saddle. We called it spur rank. And then there was army rank. And you could be, a, you could be an E4 in the saddle. And outrank in E6, it's on the ground. Really? Yeah. That's just the way, that's the way it was out there. It's, you know, with all those horses, they might want to start buying more if we can't get chips to make our vehicles run. We might be back to fighting wars on horses. <laughs> we can't, well, chi- if China doesn't sh- send us chips to build yeah. our weapons to fight China. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, um, I kept trying to make, I had this weird hero complex. I'd be sitting in, Stand sitting. I'd be sitting in the saddle, standing in ceremony out on uh, Cooper Field at division headquarters, uh, 
just imagining things that could happen where I could save the day on horseback. Yeah. Some some sort of gunman or, you know, random random attack during the ceremony. Oh, I could charge him. Draw my saber. I bet I, I, bet I could do it. Yeah, I bet I could do that. That'd be awesome. That, uh, that job was a ton of work, though, wasn't it? A ton mean, of work. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And and I credit the my time in the horse detachment um, as well as my time running cross country my freshman year. I, I credit both those experiences a lot uh, to um, passing special forces selection. Because, really? in, yeah, I mean, I credit cross country because I knew what it was like to have that fire in my lungs. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> when you're running a 5K, it... There's nothing about making a 5K that runs it. You can be in the best shape of your life. If you're running at capacity, you're running at capacity. Right. It doesn't matter how fast you're doing it. It's your capacity. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so I knew I knew what that felt like when I got into Special Forces Selection and really started pushing myself physically. Um, that, so I wasn't a stranger to that. So that helped me. And then in the horse detachment, uh, not a lot of safety net when you get thrown off a horse. Yeah. And especially in the military, you know, my, my platoon sergeant out there was, uh, he was a cowboy from East Texas. And, uh, to this day, if I, in the rare occasions that I actually do get upset, mm-hmm. I sound like I'm from East Texas because I learned to chew ass from a guy that <laughs> really <laughs> from Mount Pleasant, Texas. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> shout out to Sergeant First Class Raymond Moss, wherever you are <laughs> out there. Um, <clears throat> but but if you get thrown off out there, you, you're you expected to roll out of the way so you don't get stomped on and, and get back on. Mm-hmm. And you are verbally encouraged uh, enthusiastically to do yeah. so. Yeah. Um, so there was, there was things about that. You know, there's the euphemism of, uh, you know, you get back, bucked off, you got to get back on. Well, I think a lot of people, when they get bucked off something, metaphorically, they lay there in the dirt and they, they roll around. Right. You can do that. You might get stomped on. Right. Um, so selection is largely an individual event, even though there's team week in there. It's largely an individual event. And uh, there were definitely times in there where I, I caught myself staring at my belly button and feeling sorry for myself. Yeah. Um, but I, I think having that that unique job that had zero combat application Really, I mean, it was it was a completely ceremonial unit, but everybody out there was volunteer. Mm-hmm. And if they didn't want to be a part of that hard work or the hazing or anything else that happened out there, they were free to leave at any time. They could go back to the regular job. Yeah, and that <coughs> that has direct parallels to airborne regiments in general. Mm-hmm. It's all volunteer. You can you can terminate airborne status mm-hmm. anytime you want. And you will be treated like a, a turd, right? But you will be sent. You don't get kicked out of the army. You just get sent to a non-airborne unit. Yeah. Um, I don't think a lot of civilians know that. Everybody in the 82nd Special Forces Ranger Battalion, the 173rd, all those airborne units. It's it's a volunteer status, mm-hmm. and it's a it's a badge of pride to to be there. Right. Um, and you you have to perform, or you're gone. So. Speaking of the special that special forces, um, <clears throat> what was at what point from the from the um, cavalry stuff that you were doing did you decide, you know, the met especially the medic piece, the special forces side? Like, when did that switch, and and what was that path? Yeah, so um, there was a my first big switch in values because again, I only enlisted for two years. Uh, that happened when. Uh, when I hatched some kids and I realized looking at my kids that there were definitely things I would, I would fight for. Yeah. You know, if somebody touched one of my kids, I would definitely commit violence on, on that person. I you're, was no longer a pacifist. You would not be a conscientious, ob- conscientious objector. No. And I'm still slow to anger, you know, and I, I still avoid fights, even though I've had a intermittent career as a bouncer here and there. Um, mm-hmm. You know, Patrick Swayze, one of the best coolers in the business. <laughs> Roadhouse. Uh, <laughs> I, I definitely had a value shift there. So I, was, I wasn't really a pacifist anymore. Um, and uh, as 
is common in uh, in Young Love. My first wife and I split up, mm-hmm. um, and I was on my, I think I was on my second or third reenlistment at that point. Mm-hmm. And um, <clears throat> everything I knew up to that point was just the army and being a, a dad and a, a husband. Sometimes a good one, sometimes a shitty one. And um, now I didn't have any of that. I, I was part-time dad, but I was also in the barracks for the first time since basic training. Mm-hmm. And uh, I never really experienced my my young 20s like most people do mm-hmm. because I was in a hurry to grow up. And, and I did. And I, yeah. I grew up in a big way. So I regressed a little bit and started living my, <laughs> my, my 20s yeah. like you're supposed to. Yeah. Um, just a couple years late. And I started playing rugby for the post rugby team. And a good friend of mine, Howard Patterson, was um, he was a combo guy at Fort Hood. And he decided that he was going to go to Special Forces Selection. So I went with him to the SF recruiter's office there on Fort Hood. Mm-hmm. And uh, there are no special operations on Fort Hood. It's a completely mechanized base. The unit that I, that I came from, training horses, mm-hmm was the closest thing to anything special on that base. Yeah. And probably still is. <clears throat> um, so uh, I really didn't know what I was getting myself into. I, w- I went to the recruiter's office. They just popped a, a, a recruiting tape in the in the VHS player and hit play. And Were you there just to support him, or were you there to actually, like, go with him? I think I was curious. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to see what, what that was all about. <clears throat> and... Um, I started training with him to, to go to selection. And uh, I, honestly, I, I really didn't know what I was getting myself into. Mm-hmm. But I had decided at that point that if I didn't go to selection, I'd always wonder if I could have made it. Right. Um, I, I really didn't know what Green Berets did or didn't do. That story is probably more common than, like, we would probably imagine. Like, a lot of people, just the, Maybe. A, a male at that age just, like, wondering... Like, man, if I don't try it, I'll always wonder. Or I got to try it just because I, well, I heard John did it and he made it through. Like, if that pussy can do it, I can do it. It's entirely possible. And in, in my circle, uh, I'm the only person I know that has that story. Because, like, Evan Hafer, Evan Hafer wa- grew up wanting to be Green Beret. Right. My buddy Rob uh, started off uh, in regular infantry. And he went to the selection three times. And, and he made it on the third one. Right. I, I'm fortunate to have made it on the first one. I probably shouldn't have. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe they're just short that month. I don't know. But uh, if I hadn't made it the first time, there's no way I would have come back. Absolutely not. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Why? Well, I mean, again, my motivation for going wasn't really to be a Green Beret. It wasn't in my right. blood. It wasn't a family tradition or anything else. I, I, I just was, I needed that crucible. I needed to know if I, yep. if I had it or not. And if they told me I didn't, I wouldn't have come back and said, no, you're wrong. Right. <laughs> Everybody's like, yeah, you're probably right. I'm going to go swing a hammer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But like, uh, <clears throat> I mean, Jericho, he grew up wanting to be a ranger. That's what he wanted to do when he grew up. And that's what he became. What was the hardest part of that selection process for you? Uh, individually, uh, probably land nav because I didn't come from a tactical background. So I had to, I learned land nav at selection and in the Q course. Okay. Uh, and I'm glad I failed at it frequently because otherwise I'd probably still be bad at it today. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> but uh, physically, uh, definitely team week. So it, it, selection's a 21-day event, and uh, there's timed rucks and timed runs and land navigation worked in there, and those are individual events. Mm-hmm. You don't know at any given point when you're told to, you know, be at a – this po- point A with your running shoes and your roster number, you know you're going for a run, or it's likely you're going for a run, but you don't know for how far. So there's no way to pace it. Yeah. You don't know if you're doing two miles or ten. You don't know. The cadre know. They've got it mapped out, but you don't know. It's largely a mental game. As long as you're physically prepared, the rest of it is all in your mind. Yeah. <coughs> Team week, um, people gradually fall out over the first two weeks. Uh, You'd be surprised how many grown mass men are go to the special forces election and are scared of the dark. Really? Yeah, land nav is all at night. Yeah. <laughs> with no light. You can't walk around with a flashlight or anything else. You you can Yeah. Hit that light real quick to do a map check, but beyond that you're walking there's no walking on the roads. It's all overland in the dark. 
Yeah. And it's challenging. Um, Is that so why in Idaho you always wanted to hunt with me? You weren't <laughs> alone? Yeah, I was definitely, definitely very scared of, uh, scared of the dark and yeah, just wanted a big, strong Josh Smith with me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I figured. <laughs> Uh, we get to team week, so that's the last week, and that is um, the second to last crucible. And uh, but it's a big one. It's a big one. There's two events every day. Um, they every one of them is just a smoke fest, and you're you're given a mission. Somebody's assigned to be the team leader. You're broken down into what would be like an ODA, and you've got some kind of mission there, like resupplying guerrilla forces with water, resupplying guerrilla forces with ammo, resupplying guerrilla forces with sandbags, which makes zero sense. Right. Why would you carry full sandbags to people? Just take the empty ones there and fill them on the spot. Right. right. Some of it doesn't make any sense. Resupplying with buckets of water. Ooh, pails of pain. Yeah. Man, that, that one almost got me. <laughs> that, one, that one broke me off. Uh, the down Derman, um, which is a big-ass duffel bag that weighs who knows how much, hundreds of pounds that you're carrying on a broken litter with, and you're doing all this with your rucksack and your, and your rubber duck. Your with, rubber with not, rifle. with not having the goal or the, or the dream of being a green beret, <clears throat> it seems like it would be easy to quit, you know, because, because yeah. it's not, you don't have that goal in mind or that dream. What, what was it that kept you from quitting? It was easier for me to consider quitting in the individual events than it was the team events. Okay. Because I didn't want to quit on the dudes that were around. Yeah. Um, that being said, the one the closest I came to quitting was on the pails of pain, and that is because I overthought the technique and how to carry these things, and it was really breaking me off. And I'm walking straight up a sand hill in North Carolina with buckets of water hanging on my neck. And uh, my friend Justin, who later ended up being a sergeant major in an SFU, SMU, was on my team. He came from 275, and uh, I... I looked, I, he was younger than me, but I looked up to him because he came from a commando unit, whereas yeah. I was coming from horses. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, he came up next to me on this mission. I said, I don't think I can make it. And he told, he literally he looked at me and said, shut the fuck up. <laughs> and that was the end of it. I didn't quit. <laughs> yeah. That's <laughs> but that's awesome. the closest I came to quitting. Um, and I, I never, that's the only time I considered quitting during team week. Mm-hmm. There were times in the individual events that I thought, maybe this isn't cut out for me. But I will say being a single dad helped me out in some of that as well. Like the, um, especially, um, again, not a natural born runner. Right. But um, in some of those runs where I felt like uh, maybe, maybe this isn't for me, I would, my son was four, three, two. He was two at the time. <laughs> I imagine him on the side uh, you know, cheering me on like I was running a marathon. Yeah. And uh, I I told myself that I couldn't quit in front of him. Yeah. Whatever mental games you got to play with yourself to do it. It worked. And yeah. I hope he hears this. You yeah. Know, because I spent a lot of time gone and we've got, we're working through a lot of issues now with him being an adult and me being a little more mature and mm-hmm. less militant and yeah, definitely less combat stressed. Right. Um, but I, I don't, I don't think he knows how much of a part he played in me actually passing special forces selection. Yeah. Yeah. As I, a two year old. As a two year old. Cause I couldn't yeah. quit on him. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. That's pretty cool. So what, <coughs> where did the medic side come in then? <laughs> well, I finished the, the very last thing was a 20 miler. Um, and we stood in formation and, uh, the Kedry got out there and he, uh, this is everybody at, at the end of 21 days. And we are definitely not the same formation that we were when we started. I mean, team week, first day of team week, we lost 75 people. Wow. 75. And I think we started with 350, maybe, something like that. Yeah. So <clears throat> there might have been 100 people standing there uh, on day 21. And... Um, is that the point you're a green beret? I mean, no, is that no, no, no? Okay, no, not even close. Yeah, the overall pass rate for because you got to go through schools and stuff after that, right? Yeah. So overall pass rate, start to finish, from tryout to being awarded your green beret and special forces tab is about twenty percent. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a it's a long road, mm-hmm. as the 
It's way harder to as, as seal. the theme to Lock Rambo Harder. First Blood goes. It's a long road. <laughs> you look it up. Great song. Way harder than be- becoming a Navy SEAL. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, honestly, the biggest difference there is I don't know what their selection's like, but so many of them are, are young. You cannot be a Green Beret. By regulation, you cannot be younger than 21 and be a Green oh, Beret. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Somebody, I was listening to a podcast the other day, and he was the, his claim to fame was being the youngest SEAL ever. Yeah. Enlisted wow. at 17 and whatnot. Yeah. So, yeah, you're, you're expected to have a level of maturity. Yeah. In, in SF, yeah. which is probably also why a lot of us are older and thicker. Yeah. <laughs> than the SEAL teams. Um, what were we talking about? Oh, yeah, the, that formation. So the, the cadre got out there, and uh, he said, if you hear your roster number called, uh, go to such and such point. And he started calling numbers. We don't have names out there. We've got roster numbers. And there was a lot of roster numbers. I was like, fuck, I didn't make it. Yeah. Because there's no way this many. Yeah. This, if you're still standing here, this, this must be. This must be the no-go pile. Right. I was sure I didn't make it. And we called the last the last number. We waited for him to get off in the distance to wherever they were going. And uh, he said, if you're still standing here, congratulations. No shit. You've been selected. Yeah. That was a, Holy shit. That was a big moment. Real That's big cr- moment. So I had this huge endorphin rush going yeah. on and – one of the next things we did was go into a classroom and fill out um, our preference of, of MOSs. And I just passed 21 days of the hardest thing I'd ever done. So yeah. I knew enough by, about SF then, um, you know, from my 21 days of service yeah. <laughs> in the regiment to know that 18 Delta was the hardest MOS. So I figured, well, let's just keep going with keep that. Keep it going. Let's keep going with that trend. So I picked. So medic. that's how you chose it. That's how I picked medic. Wow. Yep. I don't think I've ever been the best at anything, but I've been pretty good. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was, I was pretty good at being a medic. Um, the the guys that were, the guys that were better than me, um, academically were, arguably on the spectrum, mm-hmm. and the guys that were better than me at actual uh, hands on medical skills were already medics when they be when they went to special forces selection. Yeah. So <clears throat> I definitely held my own. Um, Willie out in Ennis, yeah. Ennis Distillery, he and I were in the same class. And uh, I was definitely better than Willie. Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really? Uh, actually, Willie and uh, some other guys that uh, came from Ranger Battalion prior to SF, um, we were all pretty neck and neck medically, but uh, I depended heavily on those guys. I leaned on them heavily for on, in, on the tactical side of the house. Mm-hmm. Again, I mean, if we're talking about doing, uh, you know, a pivot left on horseback and, you know, get everybody lined up for a mounted cavalry charge right. on your man. You're, yeah. But if we're setting up an L-shaped or linear ambush, yeah, I, I learned all that at Fort Bragg. Whereas really? these guys have been doing it, you know, for years. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I leaned heavily on those, on, on the Rangers to. So, so 9-11 hits right in the center of that. Yep, sure did. <clears throat> what do you remember about that day? Everything. Everything. Um, Where were you? I was at Fort Bragg, but just barely. We had, uh, my class did a, uh, we had to be licensed. The, the requirement to be an 18 Delta back there is you also had to be a, a nationally registered paramedic. So in the civilian world, paramedic is typically a two-year program. We were uh, nothing to nationally registered paramedics in six months in addition to other military stuff in there. So it was very academically challenging. Yeah. And a month of that was an, uh, on the streets internship with FDNY. Mm. So I was on, you know, August, I was... You were in New York. I was in New York. Yeah, I was a paramedic in New York. So I worked with FDNY every day. And then uh, I was also working in Metropolitan Hospital in Manhattan. Mm. Um, so when we came back... Um, we were immediately immersed into a week called um, MILMED, Military Medicine, which was just essentially just to shock us back into being Army Special Forces medics rather than street paramedics. And um, 
we came in from from PT on the morning of the eleventh. Um, I don't remember what else was. I don't remember what block we were in that day, but um, the uh, the projector was showing a live feed, live news feed on the screen in front of the classroom, mm-hmm. and one of the towers was was smoking because mm-hmm. uh, the first plane had already hit. So this was they turned it on live and uh, sitting there in alphabetical order. Um, I, I remember seeing the second plane come in and, and strike. And uh, that was pretty surreal seeing that on live TV. But I just remember turning to the guy next to me. He was Kane Smith. <coughs> and uh, I just looked at him. I said, we're going to war. Yeah. And there was a, a weird kind of perverse excitement that went along with that. Um, and I don't blame myself for that because that's what I'm there training. To well, do. yeah. You yeah. Know, I'm, I'm going to get the opportunity to test your put all this work to work. Mm-hmm. Um, it was still a long road to graduation from there, but the, that whole day was tenuous because we had classmates who, um, whose parents were working in the Pentagon. Um, we had people that were, you know, their families were in New York. My fiance, I didn't know until years later was in Manhattan that day. The crazy one? No. Or this is N- different. N- Nicole. Oh. Oh, <laughs> Nicole. The one you know. Okay. She was in New York? Yeah. Wow. Yep. That's that's Holy actually shit. how we met. Yeah, years later she she read something I wrote about my 9/11 experience and she she was on she was on the ground in Manhattan. Wow. That day. Yeah. Wow, I did not know that. Yeah. Wild. Yeah, so uh thanks Ben Laden. You know that, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, it's a good complaint. We'll, we'll have his face on our wedding cake. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you think about the last couple wars that we had been in up to that point with Desert Storm, basically, would we have? We had there was Desert Storm. There was Gothic Serpent, which is Black Hawk Down. Yeah. Uh, there was Urgent Fury, which is Grenada. Uh, there's a Panama. But I mean, every one of them, we were, we just dominated. It was like it was a, like, like hundred meter game. dash, right? You know. So like, at that point, there was no reason really to even necessarily be really scared of war because we hadn't seen boots on the ground, like super super dangerous war. Except for obviously, I don't want to I don't want to diminish any small operations that happened around the globe where people got injured. But we hadn't really been. All those other conflicts we just listed off were. Um, they were direct action and they were dangerous, but they were short in duration. Yeah, and in the public and heavy eye, on air strikes. Yeah, heavy heavy in air and um, and there was definitely casualties, especially Gothic Serpent. There was definitely casualties, but in the, in public memory, it's it's kind of a blip, right? Unless somebody makes a movie out of it, it's it's kind of a blip. Well, I remember it really only affects the people that were there. I think I was in sixth grade, fifth or sixth grade, when Desert Storm happened. And we watched it on TV. We were watching. Right. That was kind of like the first war, I feel like, that was like covered live where we're like you're seeing, <clears throat> you're, you know, you're seeing the missiles coming into Baghdad and yeah. things going on. And I, I had like a distant, distant relative that flew F-16s back then. Mm-hmm. Um, his name was Greg. Actually, I can't believe I remember that. But <clears throat> um, I don't remember his last name. But. Uh, I just remember being a kid, like thinking, like, "Oh, I have a cousin that's going to war in a plane." Like that was like wild to me and and super scary. Yeah. But then it was like over in seventy two like, hours. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we just um, so I w- I could see being twenty twenty five years old, two thousand one, and like we're gonna go we're gonna go crush these fuckers, mm-hmm. and then just come home. Yeah, and, and be heroes, and you know. Desert Storm th- was largely divided in in terms of support from American populace. You know, there were signs everywhere, no blood for oil, et cetera, mm-hmm. so forth. Yeah, uh, and being you know a pacifist at the time, I was well acquainted with that. Not not at nine eleven. Nope. Everyone was on board, no. left, right, and in yeah. the middle. Everybody was an ardent patriot. Yeah. Um, Which sadly we find ourselves, um even worse today than, than before nine eleven. But like we, we, I, I've heard Rogan say this, but we really do find ourselves in a situation today that as much as you don't want to see a nine eleven happen, like 
the only thing it feels like that would unite this country right now is a 9-11 type event. Yeah. Or or a COVID type event that actually kills like 50% of the population. Yeah. And Russia knows that too. That's why Putin faked bombings. Yeah. Well, he didn't fake the bombings. He bombed his own people. W- which one? Do you, what are you talking about? He, he bombed. Young Henry, you'll have to look this up. <laughs> but <laughs> he... He uh, put V-bids. He had his intelligence service put V-bids, vehicle-borne improvised explosive devices, around apartment buildings and detonate them. And he had casualties on his own soil. To k- kick off Ukraine? I'm not, I'm not entirely sure if it was to kick off Ukraine, but it was to, to create nationalism and unify support. To start to build that. It works. And I think that's why a lot of conspiracy theorists think that 9-11 was an inside job. Right. Because we, as a country, we actually benefited from it in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And and for a while, in a a lot of ways. But Mm -hmm. then, obviously, ultimately, um, not at all. Right. And actually found ourselves. It's funny. We went to the highest of highs, you know, when you think about George Bush walking out in Yankee Stadium and throwing out a first pitch to where we are today. Yeah. <clears throat> it's almost like, you know, like the guy doing, you know, meth, where he does a little bit of meth and he reaches that high, but then he goes back to a lower, lower, low. Yeah. Then you got to do some more meth. But then every time you come off of it, you get lower. It feels like we've we've come off of all that and we just kind of keep, as a country, fighting and going lower. I mean, I've um, never done meth, but mm. like your analogy. Well, you just said you did acid, so I, I, I just figured. They're not, not even remotely. Well, I mean, I guess they're, they're both assume. illegal, I guess. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, so uh, that happens, and I would imagine, I've heard other people say on podcasts, like, they all thought they were going to war, like, tomorrow. Like, we're going. Right, and people that enlisted, I've, I've, you know, I've heard people talk about enlisting, and being upset that they can't get in early enough because they're afraid they're going to miss it. Yeah, and I, I've heard guys say that, like, they guys that were, like, early on in their training, maybe they were in buds yeah. or whatever, and they thought, I, I'm going to miss this whole Well, war. so that's what I thought, because we were only halfway through the medical portion of special forces school. Yeah, so you know, you, you knew at that point you weren't going right off the bat. Right. They were sending... The only thing that could have happened right off the bat is... Um, They'd, uh, the schoolhouse had coordinated with uh, FDNY for us to, every, uh, those of us that had passed the paramedic exam, uh, to go up and, and work the streets and replace um, just help medics. And that went up to the sectof, sectof level. We had our bags packed in the back of the classroom for two weeks. We never knew if we were going or not. And it, it ended up going to the sectof. And he that said, was Rumsfeld, right? Yeah, it was Rumsfeld. Yeah. And he said, he said, to, he said keep, them in, keep them in class. They're going to be busy enough. Right. Yeah. And he was not wrong. No. May have been wrong about some things, but that wasn't one of them. And well, and it was it was months before we ended up actually going. How how, how long did it take? A month. What's that? Before we were in Afghanistan. Yeah, I, I was we had we had ground forces there in October. Okay. Yeah. So it was. I guess it was pretty quick. Yeah, but it wasn't. But I mean, full on. We we're talking like a couple teams. But the initial invasion wasn't. There wasn't really an invasion of of Afghanistan. It was. No, I it, guess I'm thinking Iraq. I'm thinking I'm thinking more. Yeah, and a lot Iraq. of people do that, and it, it's fine. You you didn't serve, so it's it's common for <laughs> yeah. civilians to mix up conflicts and. <laughs> yeah, well, it's uh, yeah, and I well I get mixed up, yeah, because because we ended up so deep in Iraq for so long, yeah, and then <clears throat> obviously the whole Afghanistan thing, but like. <clears throat> so it's interesting because I didn't end up in Afghanistan until after the invasion of Iraq. Oh really? Mm-hmm. And even and even that, um, my tour, my first tour, is considered the early days. So I I got to Afghanistan in uh, in two thousand three. And it probably felt at that point like it had been going on for a long time. Uh, like you were late getting to it. Or? Yeah, I did feel <coughs> I did feel late getting there because by that time, you know, that fat dude with the pineapple grenade on his hip had already been on the the cover of every Newsweek and Time Magazine and whatnot. And, uh, you know, the horse soldiers thing had already happened. And, yeah, felt like I'd missed out. And I'll be honest, that like the, my first trip there was 
in the grand scheme of things for being Afghanistan was relatively safe. I mean, I, I still saw a smidgen of action here and there, but nothing like what my guys saw in later years. So I was going to ask that when it came, came to action and like how Connecticut was and all that, did, did it take a couple of years? I, I, and I don't remember this. Did it take a, <clears throat> a couple of years for basically for the Afghans to figure out how to start fighting us to start inflicting pain or uh, were we having casualties pretty early on? We, well, I mean, we had casualties early on, but it wasn't as kinetic as it was uh, in, in later years. Did and that, did that come from Iran and some of these other bad actors? Pakistan, Iran, China. Chechnya. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not so much China. Not so much. No. That, that's only a 70 kilometer border and it's mountainous. Okay. Yeah. So they're not moving yeah. much for weapons over the Not not that I saw. Yeah. There was plenty of weapons over there, but they weren't really like I saw imported uh rockets and whatnot from Iran when I was in Iraq. I didn't mm-hmm. see a lot of modern imported stuff when I was in Afghanistan. A lot of what I was blowing up because I would help EOD do demo shots and whatnot. A lot mm-hmm. of what we were blowing up was stuff that had been there from whatever conflict in the in the past. What do you remember your mindset being when your boots first hit the ground there um well it was uh it was kind of split in half one was i hope my leg doesn't give out on me and the second was let's let's go do this let's get it on yeah and i was i mean i was a i was a baby snake you know I i was ready to punch my fangs into something but i didn't really know how to control that venom yeah um looking back on it man i i did I did some things that I was surprisingly successful at just because I was overconfident. Mm-hmm. But man, <laughs> it could have gone south. They could have gone so south. Yeah. Um, but on the on the leg thing, I broke my leg in a in a street fight uh, just a couple months prior to being deployed. Really? Yeah. <laughs> How'd that happen? Uh, it got stomped on. I was in a I was in a knife fight on First Ave in Seattle. I didn't know it was a knife fight until the police came and asked for the knife. Uh, was it a Montana Knife Company knife? <laughs> it was not. No? I, I never actually saw the knife, so I'm not really sure. I mean, I, I Did saw it Did you get one stabbed? Uh, I got slashed. Really? Yeah. Where? Uh, across the face. Really? Yeah. Uh, right across the bottom of my chin. Yeah. Endorphins were going. I didn't I didn't know at the time. You and Andy Frisilla. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. We're a rare breed. It's true. Thank you for our service. <clears throat> That's wild. Yeah. And then you got your legs stomped on? Yeah, uh, friendly fire. Yeah, so um, this was at a bar called Fado where I was uh, I was working the door. And some people got kicked out of the club next door, which was known for cokeheads and Russian mafia. And uh, they had two Samoan brothers that worked. You were working the door as an active duty? I was in the guard. Okay. Yeah, so when I went to selection, I was active. Okay. But I did it with the intent of going to 19th group. Because nothing was really going on at the time except Bosnia. Yeah. And I, I you know, I decided I could have done that anytime I wanted. But what I didn't want to do was spend the rest of my military career at Fort Bragg or Fort Campbell. Mm-hmm. And the only way to guarantee that I wasn't going to get stuck at Fort Bragg or Fort Campbell was to go to the guard. Okay. That's how I ended up being 19th. Okay. Yeah. I was active when I went SF. I was guard when I finished SF. <laughs> oh, <laughs> when wow. I, when I finished the Q course. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. It's a, it's a unique way to do it, but I did it. So when you broke your leg, were your, was your thought like, now I'm not going to get to deploy? Or? I didn't know I broke it uh, initially. So um, I was on the ground um, with a dude. I just rammed his head into a marble wall <laughs> uh, and he collapsed. Um, and I had him in a headlock and I was, in the process of gouging his eye out, uh, again, baby snake. <laughs> yeah. I've been pretty controlled up to this point, but it was a three-on-one fight. And uh, after he had butted me in the chin, uh, like it, it, the fight had broken up, and then it came back together. And when he had butted me in the chin, when I was standing between him and some some of our uh, our patrons on the patio, um, I just I'd had enough at that point, and I yeah I one punch and he doubled over and I, while he was doubled over, I put him in my headlock, ran into the marble wall a couple times 
he went down. I went down with him. And at that point, I was the only bouncer working our, our bar. Yeah. At that point, my, my manager, Ed, had gone around the corner to the Allen Thistle uh, where they had a rougher crew. Mm-hmm. And they came running up the hill. And all I saw was a shirtless white guy beating the crap out of this, this dude on the ground. Oh. So they jumped on me. Really? Yeah. So one of the guys from the Owl stomped on my, my leg and broke my fib, broke my fibula. Damn. Yeah. So I said, ow, ow, same team. And they, <laughs> they helped me up, and I tried to put weight on. I was like, ooh, that's not right. Really? Yeah. So I just asked for a stool and a Bloody Mary. Jeez. <laughs> Worked the rest of the night. But I, it was it was three days of limping around before I finally went and got x-rays and confirmed what I already knew, but I didn't want to know. So when you got to Afghanistan, you were just kind of like mostly healed, but not all the way. So I walked down to, um, to the state headquarters, uh, to mobilize and I was in a walking cast and I remember master Sergeant Tim Owens, um, coming out of this admin office and he was sizing me up and he goes, he, he looks at my my walking cast and he's like, oh, you, you, and he looks back at me. He's like, "You got to trim those sideburns." <laughs> <laughs> so I convinced um, I convinced a, a PA who had gone to PA civilian PA school with one of our uh, SF medics, uh, Chris Carson, who works in the State Department now. Um, they were classmates at University of Washington. I had convinced her that I wasn't going to do anything dangerous the first several months that I was in Afghanistan. Sure. Yeah. And that I was a special forces medic and I was, I, I knew the limits of, of everything. And, uh, she was also in the guard. So she signed off on my, my deployment. Physical. Nice. Yeah. And I just did my best not to limp around while yeah. we were doing pre-mobilization training. But wow. I was, I was, I mobilized with a broken leg. Wow. That's <laughs> wild. Yeah. Now, do you remember, um, you know, do you remember your first casualty that you, you had to work on? Was it? Vividly. What Vividly. was that? I, I, I have to imagine you would be, um, this isn't, this isn't really at all the same, but it kind of is like when I, when I was, when I went through my apprenticeship training to become a lineman. Mm-hmm. You're always with people. You're with journeymen. You're with other other apprentices. You're always you can always like second guess yourself to someone who knows more, an older individual. Yeah, I didn't have a lot of hands on treatment with that one uh, because I was my team at the time was uh, assigned to what's called ASD duty, uh, which is area support detachment. I think is what it stands for. Essentially, we're in the rear, um, taking care of. We're, we're basically the liaisons between the ODAs in their fire bases or wherever they're, they're at and the support guys. We're making sure that they're getting everything that they need. Yeah. Um, and, man, we were salty because of it. Nobody wants to be stuck in that. Yeah. Looking back on it, there's a little footnote for any young Green Berets out there. If you get a chance to be an ASD, go do it and go do it early because you're going to learn so much about how that backside works and you're going to make the connections with the support people. And you need those connections. Yeah. Yeah. You can't just be a door kicking Johnny. Yeah. It's not, it's not how SF works. Yeah. Um, but, uh, the, Asadabad was one of my, my fire bases that I was mm-hmm. taking care of. And, um, we had an active, uh, medevac going on and it was, uh, a four year old girl who'd been shot in the face. Oh, wow. With an AK. And Doc Travis, who is a legend uh, in 19th group, he was he was on the ground in Asadabad, and uh, between the the helo lifting off from Asadabad, uh, way up in the Kunar province, um, between the time it lifted off and be and it landed at Bagram Airfield, uh, he had resuscitated her four times. Wow. Yeah. Um, and. Uh, I was moonlighting at the cache anyway, the Conrad Sport Hospital. Um, one, to keep my skills up, and two, because that's where nurses are. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. So everybody at the cache knew me. I walked in, and uh, I was I was essentially doing L&O work, but I remember Doc Travis walking in that tent, because back then the cache was all tents. And uh, he walked in, and he had her. Um, he had 
this four year old girl, Sam Grewer was her name. He had her in his arms wrapped in a homemade blanket and she was gone. Wow. So I never actually did any hands on treatment with her, but mm-hmm. the army, the patient administration, um, team from the combat support hospital messed everything up so bad the rest of that night I took charge of I basically took charge of her dad her dad was with was with her okay um and uh they the the combat support hospital for some reason believed that this guy who just flown several (laughs) I mean it's not it's not a just a quick uh, flight from Asadabad to, to Bagram. Mm. Yeah. Um, and it's not like you just jumped on email real quick to let Uncle Habib know that they're coming, but they believed that he had family at the gate waiting for him. And Islamic culture, you've got to have your, your dead in the ground within 24 hours. Why? Oh, really? I don't know, but that's that's Islamic culture. So it's important for them to get back to Asadabad. Um, but patient administration said... He's got family at the gate, so load him up in an ambulance and uh, and load the girl with her and go to the gate. And I just, something wasn't right about that, so I jumped in the back of the ambulance with them. And uh, we rode to the gate, and of course he doesn't speak English. I don't speak Pashto. But we get to the gate, and there's interpreters at the, at the main gate. And I asked for one of the interpreters to come down. I told the driver to stop and not do anything else. And uh, I, I was just... I was flexing my special forces muscle. You know? Yeah. Um, and that long tab is the only reason anybody listened to me that, that whole night, because there was definitely about half the people that I was telling what to do. Mm-hmm. They, they definitely outranked me. But um, I asked for an interpreter to come down and I asked through the interpreter, I said, Hey, do you have family here? And he's like, no, <laughs> I said, I didn't think so. So I am, um, I, I had the, the drivers coordinate. I, I told him to radio back to the patient administration, say, "Hey, there's no family here." And uh, that captain there was was barking orders and telling him, "Hey, you will drop them at the gate, and you'll do this, blah blah blah." And I just said, "We're not doing that." And <laughs> you know, yeah, it sounds super dramatic, but I just said, well, "No, we're not doing that." Yeah. I may I may have said, "Sir," at the end of it. I don't know, right? But I, mm-hmm. I flexed on him, and he backed down, and <clears throat> I. Uh, we had this uh, house just off base uh, that Civil Affairs was running. We called it the Ronald McDonald House, and that's you, we couldn't have local nationals just staying all willy nilly in Bagram Airfield, right? So they stayed there. So I coordinated with Civil Affairs for the dad to be there, and I coordinated with Mortuary Affairs for his little girl to be dropped off there. And uh, so we pulled up to the Mortuary Affairs tent, and it's two dudes in there, two military coroners essentially, and. Uh, I told the dad to wait there for a second. I walked in there and I said, hey, do you guys know you've got a casualty coming in there? They're like, yeah. I said, do you know what it is? They're like, no, we just heard it was a local. I was like, it's a four-year-old girl. The dad's with her. I just I just want you to be ready. Because I imagine you have to be pretty fucking turned off and callous emotionally yes. to, be, to do that. I said, I just wanted to let you know before it came in. It's like, oh. And you kind of see their eyes get wide. Right. So... I go back to the back of the FLA and I, I lead the dad down and he's carrying his daughter in that wrapped up blanket, that homemade blanket. And uh, he comes in and he sets her down. And I said to the interpreter, I've got the interpreter with me. I said, do you want to have a moment by yourself? And he just shook his head and said, nay. Afghans are some hard people. Man. They're some hard people. But I mean, even this, I, I remember the, the casualty affairs kid, the coroner, he like, he had to go to the corner, and I could see him crying a little bit. How did that girl get injured? Was she, it from us or from no <clears throat> Taliban? Or it might have been Taliban. It might have been neighbor on neighbor violence. It's it's hard to say. I never learned. <clears throat> I've, I've dealt with a number of casualties like that. So that's what in in talking to a couple other medics, it sounded like they worked on as many or more locals than the, as they did I- any of our own guys. Yeah. Most of who I treated, uh, that tour was, was Afghans. Um, I didn't treat a single gunshot wound on an American that trip. Mm-hmm. I treated gunshot wounds on, on Afghans and mine glass on Afghans. And 
Do they tend to step on or run over a lot of their own IEDs that they don't know are buried? It wasn't IEDs back then. It was it was old Russian mines. Okay, so that really still yeah. Um, well, actually, I think you told me a story in hunting camp about a horse that got away. Yeah, yeah. And was that in that tournament, or wasn't it? Buskashi. Yep. Yeah. I saw a horse step on a old Russian anti personnel mine, blew his hoof wall off. That is wild. Yeah. It's incredible, and you know, I've heard the stories about even just some of the most remote remote parts of of, of parts of Afghanistan, like when our when our guys showed up and they thought we were. The Russians, like they, they still thought they were fighting the Russians. I went to a village like that, um, way up in the mountains on the Afpec border in the northern end of the Kunar province. Um, we we went out. It was a three day foot patrol. We went out uh, to this village to um, see if it was a smuggling route and to look for bad guys. And uh, after we did a cordon and search of the village. It was a daytime cordon search um, because our, the bulk of our force was our Afghan militia, and they don't have night vision. When you're searching a village like that, are you searching in the houses too? Mm-hmm. Are you are you just pretty much like searching whatever you want to search? Yes, but we're not being dicks about it. Okay, because that's how you make enemies. Yeah, and we're not trying to make enemies. Um, Af- Afghanistan has a culture of you know the the strongest person wins. Mm-hmm. Uh, but even with that, you know, <laughs> you can you can be an aggressor and not be an asshole about it. And I know that sounds kind of strange, but we don't know who we're dealing with up there. They might be they might be good guys. They might be our allies, right? But if we're assholes to them, they're not going to be our allies for long. Did you guys realize that that early on in the war, or, or did that? Yeah. So that wasn't something that came to you later that is because there's the whole hearts and mind thing that so that i I think that honestly is we talked about the special forces recruiting for maturity and that's part of that okay yeah um as as the wars progressed i think uh sf started leaning more towards direct action just because that's what the battlefield lends itself to Mm -hmm. but um but early on uh definitely it was definitely unconventional warfare and, and hearts and minds. So back to that village, you you come into that village to do the search. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. In fact, there's a famous photo, which I'm not the first person to post. I, I posted it after it had been circulating on my uh, GWAT fanboy pages. There's this famous photo of, of uh, some dudes standing on a, on a ridge line in Afghanistan wearing shorts. And uh, one dude's got a sniper rifle. Another dude's got a, uh, an M21, which is, you know, M14 with a scope on it. And uh, another dude with an M4 and wearing UDTs. That was, I'm the guy with the M24 in that photo. So this is that patrol. Um, and a couple of Afghans in there. One of my dudes wearing a, like cricket shoes or something. Mm-hmm. But it was with the socks blasted up, socks pulled up over his, his desert cami that we gave him. It's pretty funny. <coughs> that dude was actually awesome. His name was Rocky. He was one of my medics that I trained up. Anyway, that that's that patrol. Um, but we, uh, yeah, we did our court on a search. Um, and we let our Afghans do most of that. Uh, they were very loyal to us. Um, the blue on green stuff didn't really kick off till a couple of years after that. Mm-hmm. Um, they loved us. Our, our Afghans loved us. They were fiercely loyal. Um, and we also had uh, a fire team of or maybe a squad of Marines from two eight with us on that as well. And they were combat experienced. They'd, uh, they'd been in Nazaria in Iraq and then deployed straight to Afghanistan with hardly a, a break. So they were, they were pretty salty. Yeah. Um, and I was glad to have them cause honestly they had more combat experience than I did. Right. And I learned, I learned a lot from, from yeah. them. Uh, tactically, just kind of combat super sense. Mm-hmm. Like some of those guys found uh, caches that I would have, just because they kind of had a sixth sense about it, they found weapons and explosive caches that <coughs> we would have gone right past. Yeah. <coughs> but after that uh, quarter on search was over, we, I mean, the village elders 
invited us in for, for chai and we sat down and we, we just talked. And I remember asking him this is long journey to circle back to what you're talking about with the Russians. I said, this is the most remote village I've ever been in. And, uh, and it, and it took more than a day to walk there and, and it's up in the mountains. And he, uh, I said, have you ever seen white people before? And he goes, Whoa, which is posh too for yes. And I said, I was surprised. I was like, really? When? He said, when the Russians were here. Really? So, yeah. He goes, he said, he's, I said, I didn't say white people. I said, have you ever seen Americans before? Cause I was curious because there had been a CIA base north of us very, very early in the war and then abandoned. Um, and I, I wanted to know if they'd been in that area because of, of course they're not talking to us. Uh, and he said, he said, whoa. I said, when? I'm thinking, are they still operating out here? Right. And, uh, and he goes, when the Russians were here, he said, three Americans for every 100 Mujahideen. It's like, damn, that's awesome. Wow. It was just really cool because I, I knew I was the first American that had been there since 10th group had been there yeah. when the Russians were there. And my command sergeant major in C. DeSoto for the time was one of those Americans. Oh, really? Yeah. That's wild. That yeah. had been wild for him. Yeah. Which is, you know, fast forward, my last trip to Afghanistan was uh, was 2017. I left in 2018. And um, being a senior dude, I was a sergeant major with a task force unit over there. And... Um, I, I reflected on that because I was like, you know, my first trip over here wasn't too long after the war kicked off and my CSM had been there 20 years prior, 20 plus years prior. And here I am, I'm kind of that guy. Right. I'm, I, I remember the early days of this place. I remember what was right in this spot where I'm standing Yeah. 20 years ago. And I've got people here. I've, I've got, there's a captain manning a, a computer down there that I taught in ROTC. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Definitely feeling like the old guy. Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> what, uh, what's it like? I, I always try to impress on my children, and I, <clears throat> you know, when we went to Mexico on a family uh, vacation, uh, well, not family, just my wife and I actually with some friends, but we, we got toured around by a local there, um, just a couple miles from the beach in Cabo and got to tour like the worst of the worst about how these people live. Mm -hmm. And these are people that are walking mile down to the beach and they're working in, you know, three and four star restaurants and electricity and all the glam and glitz and glamour of, of the lights of a tourist town right on the beach in yeah. Mexico with money flowing. And then they walk some of them really, frankly, less than a mile. And they're in just like the worst living conditions that you can imagine practically. Yeah. I mean, garbage pieces of plywood, you know, makeshift plywood shit to, to build a house and yeah. pieces of plastic and tarp and shit stapled. And they're just throwing their garbage out in the desert and the cactus. I mean, mm -hmm. anybody can see this if you just walk a mile from the beach at Cabo. Right. It's the desert is garbage as far as you can see. Yeah. And gets into a long overall story about, <clears throat> you know, I, I had asked that local guy that was taking us around to show us because we had a connection. He spoke perfect English. He actually went to high school in the U.S. and lives back down there. And what's all this garbage about? You know, and, and we were talking about running water, too. And he was talking about, how you know, not having running water. And he was talking about with a socialist country, the government's in charge of of filling your water tanks and they have water tanks on top of their houses that just get heated by the sun and it mm -hmm. flows down into the house from gravity. Well, whoever's running the water company gets paid off by whoever, some guy that owns a water company. And they, all of a sudden the government's not filling, filling those tanks. I'm always trying to impress upon my kids, like how lucky we are to live in this country. Yeah, yeah. And like the biggest worry that my kid has like tonight is how he plays in a junior high basketball game. Right. Like that's it. It puts it in perspective, yeah. And what was it like seeing how those people live, especially some of the, you know, travesties that you saw with <clears throat> kids and you, you see these kids being forced into terrible situations um, to basically help fight this war? Like, yeah. what was that like seeing that? And how, how do you look at our own country now? 
I didn't um, I didn't see a lot of childhood or uh, child fighters mm-hmm. uh, in in Afghanistan. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll preface this with saying that uh, Afghanistan wasn't the the first developing nation that I had seen. Uh, Mexico wasn't, and I didn't see it from a resort standpoint. I when I was a pastor's kid in high school, two spring breaks in a row, uh, I was part of a group of students, high school students, that went down and built uh, cinder block, a cinder block church in, in a really poor area of Baja. Mm-hmm. Um, so when you talk about like the the cardboard and tin shacks and whatnot, I, I saw all that and uh, and was, I mean, I, w- I was immersed in it. So I already kind of had an appreciation for for what I had back home, mm-hmm. uh, even before I was out of high school. But that's just in terms of creature comforts and whatnot. I don't think I fully appreciated what we have in terms of our civil liberties. Yeah. In until uh, I started deploying to places with you know just t- terrible regimes like the Taliban or. Or violent dictators like uh, like Saddam, um, and that really did give me an appreciation for for what we have here and for what we what we take for granted. And it sounds so cliche, but it's it is so difficult to express to somebody who hasn't seen anything but this. Right. There's really no way to impress upon that person that we won the lottery. We won the lottery by being born here. I was saying this on on that that podcast, uh, Hunter's Quest. He, he was asking me about uh, religion and whatnot, and I mean, part of what kept me from going back to, um, you know, the the church that I was raised in um, was I I realized as as fervent as I was for the the religion and the theology that I was raised in. Uh, I always thought I would come back, but when I went to Afghanistan, I realized that that same fervency, if I had been raised as the son of a mullah right. instead of a pastor, I'd be Taliban. Right. I'd straight up be Taliban. I'd be Muj. Yeah. That was the that was the difference between them and me, is I, I won the lottery. Right. I was, I was lucky enough to be born in America. Yeah, or you would be Buddhist in another country or whatever. I mean, yeah. <clears throat> So <clears throat> I, that was that was a big eye opening event for me, um, and and I think um, in terms of cultural understanding, it gave me more more patience, uh, just at, because I knew how I was raised and seen how other people were raised. Sometimes it it is a matter of culture. Now, if if you're shooting at me and that's part of your culture, I am going to shoot you in the face. Right. I've, I've got no issues with that. That's that I'm not turning the other cheek. Right. Same if that person is shooting at somebody else. I'm going to smoke that person. Right. No no ifs, ands, or buts. I have zero qualms about that. Mm-hmm. But uh, in, in the grand scheme of things, in terms of negotiating <laughs> and cultural integration and things like that, I think I've got a, a, a pretty long fuse. And <clears throat> That's actually one of my, not to dive down the religion rabbit hole, but I'm not a, a super religious person, but it's one of my biggest problems with the idea of like non-believers going to hell or this or that or whatever. And I'm like, so this entire half of the globe is just going to go to hell because they were yeah. born over there. Right. And like raised in a different way. Like the whole idea of religion in general and most religions really is basically l- love your family and be good to your neighbor. Yeah. That's a great message. You know, that's one of the things that, I asked a lot of questions when I was growing up in the church and there's a lot of, I didn't get a lot of clear answers for some of these questions. And one of them was what happens to somebody's soul if a missionary doesn't get there in time? I didn't, I never got a clear, that was a, well, let's move on to the next subject. Yeah. (laughs) Nobody knows. The other thing amazing (laughs) about religion is when my wife and I were just in Spain and I, I actually enjoyed history when I was in high school, but I didn't pay attention. I mean, when you don't have the perspective as a kid, you kind of somewhat pay attention and you get a decent grade. But, like, <clears throat> one of my favorite teachers was a history teacher, Mr. Roberson. And 
you know, I actually found it interesting, but I didn't pay attention as much to world history because I was mostly just interested. I really liked like Montana history, government, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, U.S. world or U.S. history. Right. Um, But when we were in Spain, uh, after our hunt, we started traveling kind of around. And of course, pretty much the only thing to do is go look at cathedrals. And so we stop at a couple of these different cathedrals and you start to realize like, Oh, we're in a Catholic cathedral, but it was built by Muslims or it was built by Catholics. And then you read the history and it was like from this time to this time, it was Catholic. But then for the next 600 years, it was Muslim. It's like, and then the crusades <laughs> came along. And then for the last 800 years or a thousand years, it's been, you know, it's a Christian. lot like the Shenandoah Valley in Virginia, except on a much tor- shorter time span. <laughs> this yeah. town changed hounds. 700 times in the Civil War. <laughs> yeah. That's the Winchester, Virginia, when I lived there. It, it's kind of like that. Anyway. Really? Yeah. Yeah, but it, and then you start looking at a map, and, you know, there's a ton of Muslim people there, ton of, you know, Catholics. And then you start looking at a map, and you look at how close Spain is to Africa. Yeah. I mean, and it's separated by, you know, the Strait of Gibraltar or whatever that's a quarter of an inch wide on a map. Right. Like, Spain's basically Africa. It just happens to be separated by a bathtub. Like, yeah. <clears throat> it's just wild to think about how long religious people have been fighting each other. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm, I think the only other thing that's caused more wars than religion, or not more, but causes the same amount of shit these days is natural resources and money. You know, well, I might be overgeneralizing it, but I think it's all, all the same thing. It's all connected, yeah. It's all. You know, it's not a fight for a soul. It's <laughs> a fight for influence. It's a fight for power. That's, yeah, that's my take on it. Yeah, it's it's wild. Well, so you know, with your uh, what was do you have a story or two from your medic career? Um, I know you have a couple that are like on the funny side, you know, or, or ironic situations you found yourself in. I mean, aside from having my (laughs) nuts glued to my tank. Well, yeah, besides (laughs) that, that's just a poor judgment as a, (laughs) as a young man and selecting partners in life. Uh, there has to have been some wild situations you were a part of. Um, I think I heard one story one time or parts of it about you, uh, cutting a leg off of, uh, yeah, and I've 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 uh, I've mentioned this in uh, the uh, medevac podcast. Black Rifle, I told this story, but um, uh, yeah, this was Afghanistan, um, out on the AFPAC border, a uh, place called Naray, which later turned into Bob Bostic, for those that deployed there later. Um, I had a dude that came in, an old guy that came in with his foot facing 180 degrees the wrong direction, and. Uh, uh, Afghans are kind of like Jehovah Witness. They don't celebrate their birthdays, except J-Dubs generally know how old they are. Afghans do not. This dude, I've, I've had people that are clearly geriatrics tell me they're 16 years old. Really? Yeah, they just they have no clue. That's wild. How old they are. <laughs> yeah. The, the concept of a birthday is, is uh, completely foreign to them. Well, it wasn't their accomplishment anyway. It was their mom's accomplishment. <laughs> sure. Yeah, <laughs> who has zero rights there. I mean, that's she did her part. She she bred. Yeah. Great. Get back yeah. and man the rice pot. It's what she was supposed to do. So um, this guy came in somewhere between dirt and Jesus old, and he was on his nephew's back, foot hanging loose, 180 degrees in the wrong direction. And uh, he'd been in a car wreck six months prior. This thing had been completely for six months. For six months, yep. And um, he was in pain, but he was dealing with it. And uh, I'm uh, this is in a collot uh, in a mud hut. Um, and I, special forces medics are are trained in radiology. We're we're trained in some some basic surgical practices, anesthesia, dentistry, veterinary medicine, and we've done rotations in in hospitals just like residents uh, have so <clears throat> i generally know what i need to do to to fix this guy's leg and i also know that i don't have the materials to do it yeah um so i tell him hey man i 
I don't have the supplies to, to fix you. You need to go to Pakistan. And I'm, I'm trying to turn him away. And uh, I'd been talking to his nephew the entire time. He hadn't really been saying anything. And uh, he says something in a posture in this pale, raspy voice. And I asked my interpreter what he said. He goes, can't you just cut it off? I was like, yeah, I can do that. So I told him to come back the next Saturday because I needed to get all the supplies. I needed to request the supplies to do it. And for this one, I needed to request permission. Yeah. So I asked the doctor back in Asadabad, who was on med control. I, I presented the case to him over data on, uh, on the PIS-5's it's a radio system. And uh, he writes back, he said, uh, I agree with your prognosis and your care plan. Um, he said, no pressure, but the record for a BKA, a bullet knee amputation in the Civil War is three minutes. But no Jeez. pressure, doc. That's what oh he said, no gosh. pressure, doc. <clears throat> so um, I, I kick him out of the base, and I, I tell my team what's going on, my, and I assign people different roles. Because I'm the only SF medic in the camp. Yeah. Um, I've got three Afghans that I've trained to be medics myself. And it wasn't because of their medical aptitude. It's because they spoke the best English out of anybody in our strike force. Yeah. It was, it was very uh, inglorious bastards. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? And he speaks the third best Italian. I don't speak <laughs> Italian. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. The third best Italian. Bon giorno. <laughs> so... <laughs> So I've got those three dudes. I've got uh, three Navy corpsmen that belong to the Marines that are there. I've got my warrant, who I've trained to run my anesthesia. Um, my 18 Charlie, my engineer, who used to be a corpsman in the Navy, is my assistant surgeon. And um, my captain is has my camera. That's So we have footage of this. And if you scroll way back on my Instagram, you can, you can see video of this and some stills and whatnot. But uh, he comes in the camp um, the next Saturday, and our resupply bird that's supposed to have all my materials and meds and whatnot, and most notably my giggly saw, yeah, my, my wire saw that's made for bone, mm-hmm. um, none of that's come in. So I tell uh, this conventional army medic that has come out there just to get – I was doing medevacs all the time out there, and – People can hear that on the net. So I had two regular army medics that were sitting on their asses somewhere else that had requested to come out. They'd like actually sent, had their command send radio traffic to see if they could just come out and work with me. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, sure. I'm not going to eat much. <laughs> yeah. So there's no creature comforts out here. We shit in holes and we bathe in the river. <laughs> <laughs> and we eat local food. So they came out there. But uh, one of them, uh, I, I told him to go get my, uh, go get the, the uh, Sawzall blades out of the 18 Charlie kit and put them in my autoclave. Um, autoclave is a sterilizer. Mm-hmm. My autoclave was a, a plastic potato chip can that I'd filled with betadine. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so he looked at me real wide, wide eyed and he's like, you're going to cut his leg off with a sawzall. I said, yeah, <laughs> it'll work. <laughs> so that's, yeah. Uh, so he goes to do that. And right about that time I hear the, the helicopter coming in and uh, we got a, whole bunch of mail to include like six months of uh, us weekly that I'd subscribed to completely by accident when I was trying to <laughs> subscribe to U S news and weekly world report turned into us weekly. Oh my God. Six months of those issues showed up <laughs> oh all at God. once when I'm trying to cut this dude's leg off. And I think we read most of them, but uh, <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah. The stars are just like us. Amazing. Um, so I got most of the supplies that I'd requested um, the one thing that didn't come was handles for the saw because apparently that's a different supply number, stock number, and you've got to order those separately. Yeah, it wouldn't make sense to have those no. with the saw. No, no, And why would anybody in med supply throw those in when somebody's ordering a saw in the first because place? Because you didn't order them. Right, I didn't order them. It's your fault. Must not need them. Take ownership. Extreme ownership. Extreme ownership <laughs> by Marcus Luttrell. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I grabbed the Marine Lieutenant. Uh, and I, I told our guard force and whatnot, I'm like, Hey, there's going to be a couple bangs. Don't, don't freak out. So we grabbed, uh, we grabbed two thermobaric grenades, which are brand new. Uh, and we, we, I said, hold on to the pin. He's like, okay. He's like, hold on to the pin. He's like, 
And I'm looking at him. He's like, I'm going to hold on to the pin. I'm like, okay, on three. <laughs> <laughs> and we chucked him over, and I almost tossed my pin. Uh, we chucked him over, and boom, boom, over the side of the HESCO. And we both hold up our pins. I'm like, okay, good. So we walk back to where I'm going to operate in this guy. And uh, I try to put the the pins in the in the end of the saw. Because I'm going to use these grenade pins as yeah for the saw. Too big. Didn't work. Oh, really? Didn't work. Made for a cool story. Didn't yeah. work. <clears throat> put this guy down or try to put him down f- uh, um, under anesthesia and uh, we're, we're just filling him full of holes. His dirt, his, his skin is just leather. It's just leather and everybody's missing an IV on there and I've got to get IV access so I can run anesthesia, give him fluids, you know, and back then medical protocols were, if you had a trauma patient, you needed two large bore IVs on there. The dude's going to die. We know we don't do that anymore. Right. We do whole blood. But, uh, yeah, it was absolutely critical that I got an IV on there. And we'd run out of veins. So I told one of the corpsmen to get this new thing that I had been issued out of my trauma bag called a Fast One. And uh, if there's medics listening to this, they know exactly what this is. But it, the thing's pretty brutal. It's an IO kit, an intraosseous kit. So the needle goes into the bone. And it goes, in, it goes into the sternum. And this oh, thing, shit. yeah, it looks super brutal. It's uh, <laughs> when you take it out, it's a it's a red handle, thick red handle, and the end of it has um, a, a a series of pressure sensitive needles with one big spring loaded needle in the middle. And uh, when those when those pressure sensitive needles all have the equal amount of pressure, it fires that spring loaded needle with enough force that goes into the sternum and into the marrow. Um, but I'd never used one of these before. So I've got this Corman. I'm this big, bad special forces medic. I'm the, the great white hope for all of Northeastern Afghanistan. <laughs> and uh, I've got this Corman reading these instructions over my shoulder on how to do this thing. He's like, uh, apply firm, even pressure until you feel an audible thunk. I'm like, mm. thunk. Oh yeah. It was audible. <laughs> <laughs> By this time I juiced up the, the old dude with uh, ketamine in his shoulder. So he was, he was pretty high. He was out of all right. It. Yeah, because we we were just he was a pincushion by that point. But I ended up running all of his anesthesia, um, antibiotics, everything through that single line in his chest, which is uh, that's amazing. Not necessarily protocol. Yeah, yeah. So I moved him into the lieutenant's room, uh, the same one who threw the grenades with me. I kicked him out of his room and made his made his room into a operating room suite. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Very sterile. Yeah, very sterile. Uh, I'm wearing mechanic coveralls with a cravat over my beard and a backwards baseball cap. Um, Most of my crew is wearing either some kind of army poncho or a trash bag. (laughs) That's our, that's our surgical attire. Yeah. Um, My, uh, we we get him in there and uh, I've got a marker, a surgical marker to, I I prep the site, you know, belladine, everything, do do the surgical prep. He's, and he's on a, like a, an actual army litter. It, nothing about this is is first world medicine, right? Except you have got Americans doing it. But I've got a first world pen, an actual surgical marker. It's just a sterile sharpie, and I make my, I trace my line that I'm going to cut, just like you would if you're, you know, making a knife. Mm-hmm. And um, I hand the pen over to Mig, my assistant surgeon, and he does his, and I take. Uh, the scalpel. I had, had we got one of the corporate uh, corpsmen that being a scrub bitch. I'm like scalpel. I'm yeah. in mechanic cover. All this acting like I'm in mash. I'm like scalpel. Mm-hmm. And there's music playing in the background. That I had a CD that was my surgery mix from when I was in training at Fort Bragg because we we did this in training. Yeah. Yeah. This isn't the first time I've done an amputation. It's just the first time I've done it on a person. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, everybody around me is not a medic. That's the benefit of doing that in training is everybody else has the exact same training as you do. Right. And they know if you're fucking something up and they will help you out. Nobody here knows if I'm fucking something up. No one. And I'm the, and I've got to keep all their confidence as well. Right. Because might be them. It, yeah. It's just me. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to make my first incision and the old guy goes, Whoa. <laughs> as soon as the scalpel touches the skin, I'm like, Ooh, okay. Well, uh, dose him up a little yeah, more. Let's dose him up a little more. I don't know if he actually felt the pain or or not. You think uh, he's hallucinating? Maybe? It's entirely possible. So, uh, 
first off, ketamine isn't, isn't actually a painkiller. It's a disassociative amnesic, which means they can, I mean, they, they might still be able to feel things, but they're not going to remember it. Yeah. Um, the other thing is one of the things we've been taught is ketamine, one of the side effects for the elderly is sex nightmares. <laughs> Nice. So Maybe I, that's I really having. don't know what was going on there, but I decided to juice him up a little bit anyway. So I had my warrant officer hand me a uh, pre-prepped uh, syringe of lidocaine, and I just juiced him up all over, continued to cut, no biggie. And then I went over to MIG, and I'd done uh, a shark bite cut. So I'd cut like this. And the reason for that was because I needed all this tissue. I was going to cut the bone at the apex and use all that tissue to cover the stump. I did a very poor job of explaining that to my assistant surgeon or really anybody else. And he cut straight down and measure twice, cut once. It really comes into play when you're talking about bones. Oh shit. Yeah. So we get through everything. Uh, I mean, I, I know this is fucked, yeah. but I'm going to push through. I mean, We've already gone through this. I yeah. guess is I guess I could have stopped and just sewn him up right there, but who's in it to win it? Yeah. So <clears throat> we get through his through the bone and whatnot, and um, it's super hot. There's hemostats hanging all over the place, and you know, in the video you can hear Mig say, "Hey, hang on, bro," and he's grabbing him because I'm just <laughs> going. And there's social distortion playing in the background. Children are taught to hate. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so he's grabbing that, and we get through the. We get through the bone, and so now there's just this leg sitting here, and uh, I squeeze, I just, I just milk all that tissue down to the end of the stump, and I'm, I'm just hoping that I can somehow, eke. I know it's kind of like when I broke my leg before I deployed, I knew it was broken, yeah, but I didn't want it to be, yeah, so I pretended it wasn't. You're trying to make skin on this, here. <laughs> yeah, so I'm just, I'm just trying to will there to be enough tissue to cover this, this bone, the sausage, yeah. yeah. Looking back on it, I could have just cut the bone higher. It would have been fine. Yeah. But I didn't think of that then, and neither did anybody else. What did come up, though, was Mig said, well, what about that? And I went, what? And he goes, that. And he nods his head over to the end of the litter where this amputated leg is sitting. And uh, I said, hmm, okay. So I had him hold it up, and I I drew a nice big cut line. Measured twice, cut once. <laughs> and I... uh I flayed. Cut yourself a tent patch? A leg, yeah. I cut myself a patch off the dude's calf. Damn. Yeah. This is uh, b- probably the best part of the story, though. So I cut all that off, and I'm wearing surgical gloves, and I'm in a butt hut in Afghanistan, and I'm bringing it over. I'm holding it super tight because this is, this is the path to salvation. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull this out of, the, out of the dumpster fire that it is. And as I'm bringing it over to match it up to the stump, it slips because as there's fat on the underside of skin. So it slips out of my hands because I'm pulling it too tight. And it goes, and it's very cartoons. It's like, and you go, everybody go, and it hits the ground. Oh, shit. And everybody's like, it just sucks all the air out of the room. And I said, five second rule. <laughs> I picked it up. I washed it off. Tacked sewed it, on, it on, sewed it on, trimmed to fit, let everybody throw a couple stitches in. This is kind of a hey, signature. It's, it's like signing your cast. Yeah. Except we signed his leg with bad sutures. And uh, yeah. He did you ever see leg. him again? I did. Later. Yeah. So I saw him every day for about a week. Um, he could not stay overnight because yeah. security reasons. Um, was he happy? Yeah. Yeah, he was. Uh, how I knew he was happy is when he came back. <laughs> Uh, like he came back the next day and I took his drain out and whatnot. But uh, how I knew he was happy is uh, he, prior to this, his only words to me were, can't you just cut it off? The next sentence he said to me was, where's my wooden leg? Really? Yeah. To which I smiled and I said, you got to go to Pakistan. Go make one. You got to go to Pakistan, buddy. <laughs> yeah. I don't have that. Yeah. Well, with with your time over there, um, and I'd like to have you on again to tell more stories and stuff, but I want to get some of the history of how you got there. But <clears throat> what was your, what's the feeling that you have or or what are your thoughts on like how it all ended with? 
I August. feel terrible about it. And for the rest of this, I'll preface this by saying I'm still in. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I have to uh, filter what I say a little bit with the, the deference to the commander in chief, whether I like him or not. But I will also say that I, what my opinions here are my own and they don't represent the Department of Defense or any other government agency. Mm-hmm. It was a shit show. It was a fucking shit show. And I'm embarrassed. Mm-hmm. I am absolutely embarrassed. Yeah. Were you able? Hopefully that wasn't mincing words. Uh, no, <laughs> no. Um, how does it make you feel about your service over there? Do you feel, um, do you feel, do you feel failure? Do you feel, um, I don't feel just failure. anger, frustration. I'm, I'm angry. Um, I, I never really saw Afghanistan as having this beacon of hope, like we're going to make them all Americans. And that is, that is a fallacy of foreign diplomacy. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of people in the state department know that. I don't know if other people in the government know that. I think sometimes we go places and they think we just need to spread our Americanism to them. Yeah. No. And it's just going to flourish. Yeah. Human rights are human rights, but people have their own indigenous cultures. They may not align with ours. They may never. Mm -hmm. All we can do is show them there's another way, but we can't, we can't oppress them into being Americans. It's not going to work. Do you know if any of the people you worked with, you know, the indigenous people there, the locals, the, uh, Terps, you know, some of those people that you, maybe you, you know, did your medical stuff alongside of, did some yeah. of those guys get out and yeah. get over here? Yep. Um, one of them was already out. He was living in Texas, um, but his family was still over there. And uh, I was fortunate enough to be able to, um, link his family up with uh, over an organization that smuggled them out of the country. So his brother got out. Um, and I checked with him. He messaged me on Veterans Day to wish me a happy Veterans Day. And I asked him about his family. He said they were, they were doing well. So, really? yeah, I was a little concerned about the rest of his family, but we were able to. I, I, was, I was part of getting his brother out. I wasn't, you know, part of Pineapple Express or anything like that. Uh, honestly, I... I facilitated things through Instagram, mm-hmm. which is kind of weird, honestly. Yeah. My my biggest issue with uh, how we pulled out is the t- the totality of it and the suddenness of it. It it seemed more like somebody was just putting their foot down and saying, "Nope, I said it, so I got to do it, even if it wasn't a good decision." Right. That's that's h- kind of how I feel about this, and I think we talked a little about this in the kitchen, but you know the. The dude is surrounded by centuries of experience. Yeah. People that have fought in other wars, people that have fought in these wars, people that have on the ground experience, people that are foreign policy experts. Mm-hmm. He's, he doesn't have to make these decisions on his own. I just don't understand where that decision came from. We're like, we're cutting this off 100% right now. And I'm not even a thousand percent sure it was his decision. I mean, we'll probably never know, but. Not sure um, who's pulling the strings necessarily in the puppet. And maybe the puppet's got is doing it himself, but I, I, who knows? it's hard for me to believe. Yeah. I mean, and I'm not all for just having this endless war either, but I think the having the viewpoint of we can end this endless war because of a decision we make mm-hmm. is myopic. And I say it's myopic because there you don't fight a war by yourself the enemy has yeah. a vote in that and just because we pull out doesn't mean the people we are fighting stop fighting right they what we had in afghanistan was an away game yeah we had an away game and right. people that wanted to fight us would fight us in afghanistan i'm i'm sorry for the afghan people on that but that's the way it was mm-hmm. um it, it wasn't it wasn't all afghans we were fighting over there not by a a long, a long shot. Right. <clears throat> the other thing about this is strategically is we had three major airfields over there um, that we p- pumped millions of dollars, or not millions, billions yes. of dollars yeah. of infrastructure into. Um, Afghanistan borders China. It borders Iran. Right. It borders Pakistan. It's landlocked, but it, it is... It is a foothold in Central Asia, and it 
it's a it's a gateway to all the stands. If it wasn't, Russia wouldn't have invaded it in the first place. Mm-hmm. And it's very mineral rich. China was chomping at the bit to get in there. As soon right. as they as soon as our administration announced, "Hey, we're going to pull out," they're like, "Great, right? We're, we're, excuse me, we're going to go in, and we're going to milk this country. We're going to just bleed it dry for for resources," which is what they're doing. But well, we uh, still we still have bases in Japan and Germany right. and places we haven't been fighting for eighty years that are perfectly free, well run countries for the most part. If we're going to commit to being the world police, whether we say it or not, we kind of are, mm. and other countries depend on us to to be that intervention. If we're going to commit to doing that, then why are we closing our precincts? Right. I, w- I will say this in comparison to Iraq. Uh, a lot of the instability in Iraq was 100% our fault. Mm-hmm. Um, when we, w- when there was an armistice with Germany and Japan, we didn't dismantle. There, there was still a German military once they surrendered, and they they ran security alongside American forces in the army of occupation. We just kicked the Iraqis to the wall. The, the, yeah, the Nazi party itself was gone, but the German military remained. Our administration uh, decided, and I don't know if it was from the president or, you know, who, whomstever was, was in charge decided that anybody that was associated with the Ba'ath party, that was a Ba'athist, could not be in infrastructure, could not be in government. Which means you can't feed your family. Well, let's let's ignore the fact that we just alienated the essentially the the brain trust of of Iraq. The fact that uh, anybody that was actually in charge of anything that had to do with infrastructure had to be in the Baptist Party. Yeah, and we just told them we just told them that, that they can't be right. So not only are we creating insurgency, we also have a brain drain, and that left us. Uh, the the coalition of the willing to be the police force, the fire force, the the, the medical, well, everything talk- that comes talking- into the, all of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it's now falling on the U.S. military, and that's not what the U.S. military was designed for. And we're talking about a bunch of soldiers that had proven before in Dever- Desert Storm that they were more than happy to throw up the white flag, right, and just surrender. Like yeah. it's not like they had a lot of pride in what they were doing we're going to fight to the death i mean except for the fedayeen yeah yeah but i mean they the vast majority of them probably would have just taken their new mission and yeah um my my point in that is if we had left the infrastructure in place instead of firing everybody that ran the country it probably wouldn't have been such a mess and and sending home all the people that already owned guns and had training (laughs) right Yeah, to be homeless and yeah. or you know jobless and desperate. Yeah. It's a regime change. You still have a job. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a uh, the Afghanistan thing was just um for for a a college dropout knife maker. It was mind boggling to me. As I as I I actually I actually remember specifically during that whole thing, getting a map out. Because, like, my geography, I was like, man, am I am I off? And I got a map out just to look and see what the relation to China and Afghanistan was. Like, yeah. am I misremembering? And when I saw it, I was just like, <clears throat> to your point, the hundreds of millions, really, well, billions and, and trillions, frankly, mm-hmm. that we put into a place like Bagram, for, forget just how much better the draw down and exit would have potentially been run out of Bagram. Right. I mean, that alone would yep. have been worth doing it. But when we're all said and done to have a place to operate out of for the rest of time, if all we did, I think the feeling would be different for sure for a lot of the former, you know, for a lot of our veterans that fought over there. If we'd have at least just had a couple bases, it wouldn't feel like just everything was lost. Right. You could always say, well, we got a place to land some planes and fly a few drones out of, and and if we kept those air bases, who knows if the Afghan forces would have not let themselves be run over? Then maybe they wouldn't have been their post if they knew there was still air support. Yeah, we definitely put the message out there that 
you, like you have zero support for yeah. sure. You're going to have zero support. Yeah. And I, I mean, to your point, I think earlier, what you were kind of getting at was I haven't talked to anybody that was fighting over there <clears throat> that ever thought that Afghanistan was just going to be a free flourishing country without us. I mean, ev- I think everybody knew whether we left in a hurry in the dark of night like we did, or if we left over a year period when we were actually finally gone, it, it, what w- what happened was exactly what was going to happen. Right. Um, what I'm curious to see, and only time will tell, when you think about it, we, we provided an entire generation the chance to grow up from zero to 20 years old. There, there is that there, and there's really a huge section of people that grew up from the age of, let's say everyone under the age of 10 years old. So those people are now 30, Mm -hmm. 10 to 30 to zero to 20. Got to actually see like girls go to school, got to see what some peace looked like. Um, some, some law and order, yeah, and there is nothing saying that in f- thirty or forty more years, when those people are all between the ages of, you know, forty and sixty, that there isn't some major changes or some rebellions that happen, and potentially some good that comes from this. And frankly, a lot of our veterans that fought over there may never live to see it, but yeah. it, it may still happen. Yeah, I mean, uh, you you touched on earlier you. you Asking if I felt like it was a, a failure or you know waste of time, et cetera, and that's not, th- not uh, that I think that I- any of you guys think that. No, I'm, uh, but that's that's kind of my justification for for not thinking that because I do think that we made a positive impact on a lot of people. And we made uh, a lot of impacts on people's foreheads too, but yeah, we 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 did make a positive impact on on a culture. That, I mean, it's known as the graveyard of empires, but I mean, the Russians did too, to an extent. I mean, there was people that were going to school in Moscow to be learn how to be good communists and come back and run the country back in the day. And I know there's parallels there, but I, I think our system is better than communism. Therefore, I think we did it better. Right. Um, but I, I do know there's people that are still there that we had a positive influence on and they know, I don't know that they're ever going to know peace in that country. Um, unless somebody just finally says, Pakistan, you're grounded. Right. Because that's, 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 that's the Taliban AQ's safe hold, Mm -hmm. safe ground. Um, and I heard somebody say one time, an unstable Afghanistan is a, is good for Pakistan, and I don't know exactly why that is geopolitically, but I'm not a, I'm not a big fan of Pakistan. Yeah. Um. But I I do think we've made positive impacts on on people's lives there, and showing them that there is other things. There's there's people we've brought out of literally out of the Stone Age. Um. My last tour over there, I I would watch. Uh, an Afghan version of Family Feud with uh, with this NDS colonel. Um, NDS is kind of like the Afghan uh, FBI slash CIA. <laughs> we'd uh, we'd sit there and watch this, and it's it's in it's in Dari, so I didn't understand what was going on. But he'd bust up laughing, and I would ask you know I'd ask him to explain it, and he had enough patience to to tell me. But I mean, it was it was women without burqas on the same stage as, as men in suits that had no beards, you know, it was for Afghan standards. It was, it was pretty modern. And I, I took that as I compared that to my first trip in 03 when the only time I saw a woman without a burqa is when I went to a medical conference and the women, the female doctors came through a separate door. And once they got in there, they were in a safe place and they took their burqas off and, you know, shook hands and were glad to see right. their male counterparts and whatnot. But it was such a, a night and day difference where what happened in 03 was only behind closed doors with other educated people. And in 20, 2018, it was on television. It was on television. Yeah, that is wild. I mean, that right there speaks to the progress that was made. And yeah, it's basically seems as though it's all been lost, but there, 
you know, that pendulum could swing. People know, though. Yeah, it's there. <clears throat> and they're, the longer they go away from that, for a while anyway, the more they're going to miss it and, and long for those moments in those days. Yeah. Imagine, I've thought about this a couple times, like with the dozens and dozens of plane loads of people that we brought over <clears throat> from Afghanistan. Um, and I guess not everybody ended up in the U.S. A lot of it ended up in the United Arab Emirates or Europe or whatever. But of all the refugees that we brought over to the U.S., um, I can't imagine what it must be like for those people to go from living the way they were living even the ones that were living in cities and had like quote unquote decent life for Afghanistan. Yeah. Still living under a ton of fear, a ton of oppression. Yeah. A ton of desperation. Um, imagine what go like from that to you just fly 18 hours and you land a plane and you literally have zero worries at that point. Like frankly, zero worries that matter. Like you're going to get food, especially you're going to be somewhat taken care of in this country as, as a refugee for a while. I don't know if they know that though. I mean, that would be, that's a lot of uncertainty, you know, especially if you're not familiar with any of Americans except the ones you see patrolling the streets or in big armored vehicles. I don't, I, I can't imagine what it would be like for, especially not an un, uneducated or an illiterate Afghan. But after six months of living here and every single day, you you don't, you find yourself in a situation where you don't have to be in fear and your, your kids are out playing and doing what they're doing. And you just start to observe your surroundings of what everyone else is doing. All the white people that are here. <laughs> it's gotta be, I, I just wonder what goes through their minds of like, wow. Like I never even knew this was, I, I hope they can appreciate it. You know, the, I think there's probably a certain amount of homesickness going on. And I don't know that anyone ever drops their guard enough to fully appreciate what's around them. And I say that from somebody that does that on a regular basis. You yeah. Know, I, I'm a lot less on alert than I used to be. Mm -hmm. But it amazed me when we went and stayed at, down at headquarters there at Black Rifle, we just pulled our camper in there and we camped out there one night. And um, uh, Edwin. Yeah. Edwin gave me his key card to the Black Rifle headquarters and was just like, hey, there's a shower in there. There's a bathroom. Like, you guys just use it. Um, and we just had our camper set out there by the um, kind of the archery shop and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And uh, kind of basically parked on the range. And, you know, everybody was leaving for the night, closing up, and Edwin was just like, hey, man, free range of the place, enjoy it. And whatever you need, go inside and get it. And then as he's leaving, he oh, he goes, if you do see people walking around in the middle of the night, you know, with a turban on or a burqa on or something like that, like, don't worry, those are just the people cleaning. And, and you know, then he... Then he proceeded to tell. I, I started asking about it. And he's like, well, these were Afghans that in, in various ways, whether Evan knew them or there was some kind of a service connection. They're Afghan commandos and their families. Yes. Yep. Now and they're, now they're facility people in... Uh, in Salt Lake. In embroidery. Yes. <laughs> yeah, the, a lot of... Doing shirts. Yeah. If you're wearing a, a black rifle hat that has a patch on it, they took a chance it. that and the spouse of an Afghan commando sewed that on by hand. <laughs> I thought it was, <laughs> one, I thought it was wild that the connections of war brought them to that, to that point. Yep. I also thought it was in, it speaks volumes about Evan and Black Rifle Coffee and the, and the, um, the true heart that a lot of the, 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 the veterans in, in, as a whole really have about like a lot of the. Afghans that they worked with over there because it's easy to think as a civilian I know from my standpoint especially early on in the war that like I'll definitely admit like from my perspective like we were going over there after 9-11 and in my mind we were there to basically kill everybody that wanted to like stand up in our in our way at all and and I didn't and I also didn't really know or realize that there were a bunch of people that didn't feel that way I just it feels like you're going to war. Right. 
against an entire country. Right. And, and then I start seeing, you know, soldiers coming home wounded and the fact that like, oh, this isn't just a mop up of 72 hours. Like we're a year in, we're two years in, we're 10 years in. Um, and I didn't realize as just a civilian not paying maybe close enough attention that there was this whole other piece of, you know, and I know it was happening in Vietnam too. I mean, you listen to those, um, you know, SOG guys and whatnot talk about their indigenous people. I mean, they loved them as much as they did their American brothers over there. Yeah. Um, it was pretty amazing to me that, that, those people meant that much. And that's really when I started looking into it more like what's going on here and asking some questions about like, are you serious? They came all the way over from Iraq or Afghanistan to work at black rifle coffee or, you know, I think Evan found the one at a damn convenience store and he'd gotten here as a refugee. Yeah. Wally. Yeah. He was, yeah. One of our guys ran into him at a gas station in Virginia. It's insane. Yep. Um, but I think it speaks to, you know, people who are maybe kind of anti-war. Uh, not that any of us really are pro-war. Like, obviously, it'd be nice if we didn't have to fight any more wars ever. But a lot of people that might think that, like, Black, Black Rifle Coffee veterans are just, you know, killers. And they're just hungry for blood. And they just want to go over and shoot their Black Rifles and kill people and blah, 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 rah, rah. <laughs> but when you see the heart behind a lot of these veterans... And the fact that there's not very many other businesses that would hire those people. Yeah. Um, but a place like Black Rifle that was literally fighting against potentially even some of these people's direct relatives. Um, you know, it's, it's I don't know. I thought that was pretty cool. You, you mentioned the, uh, the hungry for war and just going to shoot people and whatnot. It's kind of funny because so many of us that work there, especially the dudes that are former special operations or current special operations. Um, making and selling coffee does not pay nearly what being uh, a commando does. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, th- you know, the, the drive to succeed in, in private industry so we don't have to go make our money carrying a rifle is, is pretty high. It's a pretty high motivation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I think it's a uh, it's amazing what our veterans gave during that whole time. I I I find myself sometimes a little bit ashamed of. I grew up in somewhat of a sheltered house. Like my parents definitely weren't big fans of war or. And I mean, I think they were proud of their country, but like, I think my parents grew up in that time where they just barely, like my dad just barely missed the draft for you know, Vietnam, like he was too young, right? You know, he was 10 or 12, 14, but had older brothers that were of that age. Definitely was fresh off of that. Obviously terrible war that didn't end well. Right. And so the idea 20 some years later that their son could be going to war, like I think that Vietnam was fresh in their mind. Um, It wasn't something that really got talked a lot about in our house other than just like, Oh, it's terrible. We hope that nothing happens over there. Um, I never really knew a hell of a lot about the military other than just, I, I was proud of my country, but it never crossed my mind at all to like raise my right hand and volunteer. You know, and I find that amazing that people did. Yeah. Um, some of us are just more patriotic and you know, it's something it's you have to live with. It's, it's true. It's, yeah, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> <laughs> no it's uh i don't know there it's it's something special like i, I hear people say it's all the time it's like, unfortunate you didn't join for college money because your girlfriend was pregnant like i did yeah that's, no, that's, shit. That's, all, that's all i'm saying yeah <laughs> you're basically just a socialist just wanting yeah just <laughs> that's it on the company i, I, I just the, needed a handout yeah <laughs> yeah all you veterans <laughs> all those veterans <laughs> yeah just looking for a handout no i uh uh there, there's, you know, I hear people say like, well, I didn't do anything special. I was just a supply chain guy or whatever. It's like, no, you volunteered to go into the military. Like th- the path goes a lot of directions at that point. And I've heard Andy Stumpf talk about on his podcast for all of the green berets or the Rangers or whatever at the, at the front doing the cool shit that everybody like gets the movie written about. Mm-hmm. 
there's the whole supply chain and everything that has to happen to that point. It's important. Yeah, it's very important. I imposter syndrome goes all the way to the top. I was telling uh, I was telling Henry about this young Henry. Today. Young Henry, sir. I was telling young Henry about this earlier today while you were uh, uh, on the phone when we were shooting content earlier. I said that it, it, there's always somebody that has done something that you feel is a little cooler, and it it doesn't end. It doesn't yeah. end. It, it doesn't no matter. It you could be you could be. I mean, my mentor was a squadron sergeant major in in Delta Force, and he had imposter syndrome. When he died, he was the most decorated man in the unit. Two silver stars, one's probably being upgraded, I think six bronze stars, a soldier's medal. Uh, most decorated currently serving. Yeah. And he had imposter syndrome. That dude was Superman. Right. He had imposter syndrome. Everybody has imposter syndrome. Right. And nobody thinks that their service quite stacks up to somebody else. Right. It's a It's a tiered system. And it goes all the way to the top. So there's really not much point in feeling like you didn't do enough or I was just fill in whatever job you signed up for or was signed or or you ended up doing because of whatever circumstance. Yeah. Yeah. It's um as much as I as much as sometimes I actually think that we need to have mandatory service in our country, like that's one of the things that when I when I, f- I flew a knife maker over here, Jurgen Steinau, years ago to teach at a conference I put on at my shop, and he was explaining the German, and I don't know if it's the still this way, but it was for him where when he graduated high school, you know, he was required to do a couple years of service in the military. And he was saying then that uh, he felt like it gave people a much healthier respect for um, and taught them how to use like weapons, like just rifles, guns, you know, just um, a more of an understanding of, you know, there's so many people that grow up that never touch them. Right. They're scared of them. Yeah. They're just scared of them sitting there in the corner like they're going to bite them like right. a snake. That like all of a sudden they spend two years mastering them and then put it down for the rest of their life, but they're no longer scared of it. That gun is going to vote for Trump and deny election results. <laughs> <laughs> it cannot be allowed Only to sit out like that. Only if it's a black rifle. It cannot be allowed to sit out like that. Yeah. Um, I have mixed feelings about about uh, conscription, mandatory service. Um, well, it's kind of a socialist, communist type idea. It is. Idea. I, I don't like it, one, in that uh, I like people to do whatever the fuck they want to be able to do as long as it doesn't hurt anybody else. Mm-hmm. That's kind of my political stance on everything. Um, and I don't think conscription allows for that. I also have worked with um, conscripted armies, and they're not they're not great. And that's what I was getting at about <laughs> that. That was what I was getting at about the point of all that. As much as I think it would be healthy in a lot of instances for that, I think it would be great for a lot of people. Um, I think I don't know if it was Tim Kennedy, some somebody I heard talking, and they said one of the greatest things about our military as a whole is that it's volunteer. Mm-hmm. Um, now. There are kids that volunteered for it for certain, some because they're patriotic and some because they wanted a government handout. What are you trying to say? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it is, it's volunteer. And just like you were saying with the special operations part of it, like you can, you can give that up and just walk away from walk that away. anytime you want. Um, yeah. I, I, same with a front. seal. I mean, you can stop being a seal and. I don't think you can. Go, I think it's go blood go. in, blood out. There. I don't think you can get out in, unless you've got a publishing agreement. <laughs> I think that's written in there somewhere. Yeah, and a podcast. Yeah, I love you, Terry. Um, uh, so to that point, though, I I do like what you're saying about it's it's familiarity with weapons and whatnot, but it wasn't that long ago where you could take marksmanship in high school. Yeah. You know, and I, I don't know if I'm completely comfortable with that in some rural high schools or not rural, but urban high schools. But out here, there's no reason that there shouldn't be a high school. Why isn't shooting a sport? Yeah. It, why not? At least at archery. Why? Right. Why is anything with projectiles? It's expensive to infor- ensure. 
it, it, it th- through the schools it definitely is now i know around here like there's uh you know 4h has like shooting clubs and there's yeah. you know, shooting stuff like kids can shoot trap here right completely for free all their ammo all all donated that's great so you can go join a trap club and that's what a lot of people don't realize and like i would encourage people to look into like the 4h programs because there's archery in 4h oh, there's that's great. yeah shotgunning people would lose their ever-loving minds in in seattle if there was anything that had to do with a projectile yeah i mean they're offended by language so yeah grand it's it's i think it's just yeah. a given that anything that actually launches towards something else is going to be yeah uh, a scourge of society i wanted to i wanted to say this about uh the whole conscription thing i think um this is my personal stance and i think it could be done it absolutely could be done it'll never happen but it could be done have you read the book Starship Troopers? No, I don't read books. Yeah, they're hard. And there's no pictures in this one either. I listened to a few by Jack Carr, but that's about <sighs> it. And that is a good way to do it. Especially if you're driving. Um I think citizens should citizenship should be earned. It kind of and this kind of loops back to what we were talking about with we don't really have a mechanism to have people appreciate what they have here, mm-hmm. what they're born into. I think everybody in the United States should be born into human rights, those unalienable rights that are that are laid out in the preamble of the Constitution. But I think citizenship is a responsibility. I, I don't think it's a birthright. I, I don't think you automatically should be able to steer the country just because you turned 18. Because you haven't given anything to the country. And honestly, your frontal lobe is all jacked up on yeah. <laughs> hormones anyway. I know mine was. I wasn't ready to be an adult, regardless of what I thought I was ready for at 18. <clears throat> I think I think some kind of service to the, to the country should be mandatory if you want to be a citizen. And as a citizen, I don't mean like, oh, you, you've got less rights. It's just, if you want to vote, you have to, you have to give something up first. Yeah. Um, and really that's kind of where that stops. If you want to vote, you have to have served. And I don't mean military service. Military right. service is one route. You could do right. AmeriCorps. You could do, there's so many programs out there for, for people to give back or to, to, to serve their community, mm-hmm. serve in something for two years. Right. Hell, let's drop it to a year. Serve in something for a year. Because what are you doing when you're 18 anyway? Going to, going to school, maybe. Right. Figuring out what you want to do with your life. That's what most people are doing. It's figuring out what they want to do with their life, even mm-hmm. if they're going to school. Give a year. Right. Give a year at some point in your life. You can do it later in life. That's fine, too. But if you want to vote, if you want to be at the helm, steering this big old ship, you have to show can, that you actually want to be on the ship. Can you still mail in your vote? It depends on who's running the post service. Post, post okay. Office. Yeah. It's run by aliens. I don't know if you knew that. It is? Yeah, absolutely. The post office? Yeah, 100%. Have you ever been to the post office? A couple times. Yeah. Aliens. Yeah. Well, you'd have to you'd have to be in some kind of a crazy ass state to the mail just keeps keeps coming. <laughs> just keep putting it out there and it just, it keeps, just keeps coming. Going. It'd be so frustrating. <laughs> How do you ever feel sense of accomplishment? Especially around Christmas. Can you imagine? Do you know they can fly their aircraft from like 60,000 feet straight into the water? Straight into the water. It's amazing. You know, I'm, I'm one in the, in, the, in the game of six, degree, six degrees of Kevin Bacon. Yeah. I'm, I'm one from Rogan. You are? Multiple How was that? T- multiple times. Was it Evan, Matt, Trevor, oh, yeah. Andy, Dudley? Yeah. Same. I like to call Joe like one of my best friends. I do too. Because like some of my really good friends are friends with him. He he hasn't called me anything. Yeah, but I, I will. I I call him my best friend because it, uh, if you will it, it is no dream. I learned that in the Big Lebowski. Yeah. yeah. Um, that rug really did tie the room together. <laughs> it really did. It really did. I had um on my list trapped to Afghanistan. I had that picture of Nixon bowling. Yeah. That was on his wall. I had that in inside my trailer. Yeah. <laughs> Just, just starting the movie off, writing a check for forty two cents for a gallon of milk. It's just yeah. amazing. Elves, yeah, yeah. 
Um, Donnie, shut the fuck up. Anyway. <laughs> uh, so, real quick, because we, we, we got to let young Henry get to bed here. Yeah, he's got to be here. Hours later. He's got to be here at 6 a.m. to. Yeah. Uh, if you're still with us, we appreciate you. And if this you is want to just go shoot around. the rest of the content we have to shoot and <laughs> just work all night? You need to get yeah. some NVGs out here. He's going to be like, I don't want to do any more podcasts. Those go longer than I thought. That's that's what the boys like. Anything with with NVGs. Anything under green light. Yeah. 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 Doesn't actually have to we, be we tactical need or anything. To, we, after seeing through some of that stuff uh, at out there, I, I need that. I, that's a need. Yeah. Um, Especially after the last midterm, I'm starting to think it's actually really actually going to be a need. You got to see the new stuff where it's actually got an outline. It looks like some kind of. 80s aha video really yeah an outline that it, 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 it's, it's like a fluorescent outline of the shape objects and people yeah because like uh, one of my employees brought a thermal to work the other day that's like 15 years old and like you look out in the field and just there's just lots of white blobs yeah yeah thermals yeah a little different yeah um so you're you're in the National Guard. I am. Reserves? No, it's two different things. Reserve is federal, National Guard is state. Okay. And reserve does not have combat arms, except for some staff positions. National Guard does. Okay. Yep. Okay. So if somebody I says to they're find out what the or special difference. forces or something, you know they're National Guard. Not okay. Reserve. National Guard, uh, is that how often do you have to go play army then just one week a month two weeks a year that's you know that's just that commitment it's what are you talking what are you saying it is absolutely not i feel one like week a you're month, two uh, weeks a year. accusatory um without doing anything extra i spend about three months of just just a, a basic year with regular soft training i spend about three months a year on active duty no shit yeah all told well you must be young <laughs> I mean, at my at my rank, the the pay isn't bad. I, I yeah. do I do enjoy my my drill paycheck. Well, that's good. But um, is it like the linemen as we like as the line the foremen get older and stuff? Like young guys are climbing the poles, and when we do all our training stuff, you know, they're repelling out of the buckets and stuff like that. And are you at that point where you're just like looking up there saying, "You boys are doing a good job." Mostly just because I want to be able to keep doing this. And if I break myself, I'd rather it have, have yeah. it be on a mission than your brain some, at this point is more important than your body. Yeah. To the army. Yeah. That being said, I'm in physical therapy for a hard landing from a C-130 jump in August right now. So I'm still doing it. Yeah. You know, I'm just doing it a little slower. You jumped in August, this August? Uh, a couple times. Yeah. Wow. I want to jump eventually. But I don't want to go 30 feet per second like you and Andrew. Yeah, you don't want to do it static line. Yeah. I heard you're a pussy if your feet touch the rope. Rope? On a parachute? No, on this on the uh on, on fast the fast ropes. ropes. Yeah. Uh who told you that, Beto? That sounds like something Beto would say. No, I think it was Andy. <laughs> the the other Andy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, not yeah, not Beto Andy. <laughs> Stump Andy. Yeah. No, they were laughing about how when they were young. There was always some older guy that was like, yeah. you're a pussy if your feet touch the rope. Well, I mean, if you're doing a 10-foot fast rope onto a boat, sure. I probably wouldn't use my feet either. Yeah. But I almost died fast roping once in India. In a, really? Yeah. In what they call a copter. They don't, they don't call them helicopters. They call them copters. And they don't call it fast roping. They call it slithering. It was, really? Yeah. I was. That's a better word. I was working with the Indian SAS. And uh, it's a different type of rope, too. We have a big, fat rope. It's like a braided fire hose, uh, just to because we believe in girth here in America. They have like paracord, <laughs> five fifty it's, it's, like, it's like three propeller ropes braided together. You're like, ooh, I don't like this at all. Yeah, my um, my the my barrel got caught. It was slung behind me, and uh, I already exceeded the weight limit for the ramp that we were standing on. Yeah, uh, so I felt that thing give a little bit as I'm sitting on it, and then my the barrel caught on the hydraulic arm as I'm. 70% off this thing and hanging on a rope, and it was a 90-foot fast rope because they really like to show off for their generals over there. Yeah. Yeah, a lot, a lot of saving face. So I almost died in India. 
wouldn't have been happy about that. No? No. Why? Uh, I'd been eating Indian food for like a month yeah. at that point and not really having a lot of fun because we were, we were locked down. Um, just, I mean, the Indian soldiers were good. The Indian SAS dudes were good. Um, but we were drinking a lot of Kingfisher, which is like an Indian 40 ouncer and eating a lot of curry. And I know as soon as I hit the ground, I just would have shit myself. <laughs> yeah. And I, it's not how I want to die. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that was back when we still had ACUs too. So it's not like it's going to blend into the camouflage. It's just going to be this gray, ugly camouflage uniform that nobody wants to die in in the first place. And then well, it's let's face it. It's shit. not going to be the first time you shit yourself. No, that's, that's true. That is also well documented. Um, so how did you start working for Black Rifle? I was in Special Forces with Evan. Okay. Yeah, we came from the same unit. Um, did you make fun of him for being short? I did. Yeah, I actually called him Peter Pan the first time I met him. Really? Yeah, because he's wearing silkies. He's wearing little the little uh, Ranger Panty running shorts. Yeah. And uh, little ankle socks that you could barely see. And he had just come off like a five-mile run in the woods. Being a medic, did you have to, like... Patch him up a little bit, um, check his uh, like fungus issues or. I, I mean, he asked chafing. a lot. He's like, "Hey, I think I have a tick." Yeah, I'm like, "No, you probably don't. There's no ticks here." Well, I just I just want you to be sure. And then he'd spread his cheeks. I'm like, "You don't have a tick." He's like, "Can you just really get in there?" <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, we uh, yeah, we it's where he hides his coffee beans <laughs> and we were we were on different ODAs, um, but we both have a. Uh, certain cynicism that uh that we bonded over and we became friends over that mm-hmm. and uh, we worked together on the contracting side um as well so we bounced in in and out of each other's lives quite a bit and um when he started black rifle he asked me to he asked me to write, write uh, a satire piece for the blog this was well before Coffee or Die. Mm-hmm. Um, and I never wrote it, but I wrote some other things. And this is actually when I, I had started writing. Um, so I was published under Charlie Martell uh, several times for for the Black Rifle Coffee blog. And then I deployed um, with, uh, with a task force element. And they're not real big on having professional writers as director of sergeant majors. So I tendered my temporary resignation while I deployed. I did back-to-back deployments. I came back in 2019. The company was a lot bigger. Coffee or Die was the thing. Marty was was running the show there. Um, but I didn't have my government job that I had when I deployed. They cut my position because I deployed, mm-hmm. which is illegal, by the way. Um, and uh, I'd been waiting. I got hired by Homeland Security to be a, a cop. And uh, I was waiting for my, my academy date. And Evan called me and said, you, you still going to do that cop thing? I said, if I ever get off to school, yeah. He says, well, I've got some projects that need to be managed. Why don't you come down and do that? And then, you know, maybe you'll decide not to be a cop. And uh, that was November of 2019, and here we are. So what do you do today for him? Uh, I'm the soft relations manager. Which sounds Does like that something. Does mean you're soft? Yes, super soft. Super soft birthdays. Super, <clears throat> if you're a Letter Kenny fan. Um, <laughs> Special Operations Forces Relations Manager. So this kind of stemmed out of being the formal charitable giving manager and the, uh, the director of the in-house nonprofit, the BRCC Fund, um, but also working in brand partnerships and uh, just talking to people in general. Yeah. Um, we're, we're bigger than we were when I managed, when I wore five different management hats. Um, and over the last year, since we've gone public, we, we part of that growing pain has been that we, uh, we've lost touch with, not intentionally, um, but by virtue of not, by being a bigger company, but not having a bigger staff, we've lost some of that personal touch with our 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 soft base and mm-hmm. some of the, the military people that we really count on to be part of our culture. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think really what sets Black Rifle apart from 
<clears throat> from anybody else, especially in the coffee industry, is is our soft culture. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was largely being ignored. And it wasn't intentional. It's just when you have an IPO and you've got a pending deal with Walmart and right. you're trying to keep Bass Pro and Shields happy and whatnot, what's going on at third group or 19th or whatever, it's it's not making the, the commander's dashboard. Right. You know? No, it makes sense. Yeah. So my job is to stay in touch and kind of bridge the gap between where we came from and and where we're going. Cool. Well, I want to get into uh, more, but I think we should do it another time. I want, I, I feel like we almost need to have an entire podcast about Idaho. Yeah. Um, yeah, we should. And we, we should get. <laughs> we should almost have like a family reunion. We should. We should get everybody in here for that one. That would be fun. Uh, Clancy would be def- definitely good on that. Uh, Lacey probably wouldn't say anything. She would just kind of nod and laugh. I don't know. Maybe she would. I don't know. Trevor definitely has things to say. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, as our token seal. Yeah. He's definitely <laughs> yeah. outspoken, especially about that particular trip. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it would be... Uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure. I don't know when the statute of limitations. Have to, I would have to find out what a couple of the individuals that we're running are up to today if they're, like, still trying to be outfitters and involved in all that. Maybe we should professionally stay quiet. Which is what we agreed to do yeah. initially at the end of the trip, which is why. Why you wrote an article about it. The only piece <laughs> that, that came out out of that expensive-ass backcountry hunting trip, the only people, the only media that came out was an essay about me climbing a ridgeline. <laughs> I will say, and we won't get into it, but uh, one day I'm hiking around with Tear, and him and I are huffing and puffing to climb maybe 200 feet in elevation <laughs> to get to Trevor's Bowl. And I think you arrived to, to Trevor's bowl after I did by about a half hour. Cause I think we both nearly died. And that was ridiculous. This little ravine of vines and bushes and swamp thicket. Yeah. It was, it was unbelievable. Mountain. And then the next day tier proceeds to climb Everest <laughs> to arrive quickly to arrive <laughs> Two and a half minutes after Clancy shot at the elk and didn't <laughs> wait for him. <laughs> I don't know if I would have waited for me either. Clancy's got a long stride, and I'm back there. <laughs> as as Trevor and I were actually watching the ascent from solid mile away, mile and a half, on another mountain, and I will fully admit, in front of your face, I was like, yeah, there's no way tears getting up there. No, there's no way. Like, I mean, because Clancy's a freaking in shape, dude. Like, he's in I shape. Was like, he's younger than me. He's taller than me. And I honestly I honestly didn't think Clancy would get there either because I just didn't think there was enough time for him. Let's, let me just say, there wasn't enough time. No. There wasn't. No, there was not. We, we, it was reckless on several fronts. Fe- several, fr- several fronts. <laughs> we, didn't spike, we didn't camp to spike out. We left too late. And I remember asking when I got down to camp, did Tear go? Yeah, tear went. Oh, okay. And then I hear, as you guys like are making your way up there, I'm like, no, oh, tear's still right there with them. And then like you guys are like nearly ascending the top, and it was like, yeah, tear's just like two minutes behind. Of which you handled it really well because I might have wanted to shoot at Clancy if I had made that giant ascension and he could have just waited a minute or two but i also understand why he did what he did at at that point i wasn't even hunting anymore i was i was just i was making an ascent i feel like it's kind of like the whole idea of you going to uh special forces um and even like picking what you picked to go into like it was more of that like you you tr- something triggered back in your brain of like i'm just going to do this because it's the hardest thing to do. That's exactly what happened. Yeah. I wasn't, uh, I mean, I was I was in it to hunt in the beginning, but it very quickly became just a, a physical and mental crucible. All right. Where can people find you? Uh, I live in Seattle. But uh, I prefer, what's your I prefer, home address? I prefer people not show up or announce. Um, 
Uh, on social, I'm mostly on Instagram. I avoid Facebook mostly because I too don't. Too many opinions. Too many opinions. Yeah. And I don't care about your kids that much. No. Um, so Red Leader underscore standing by on Instagram. Uh, LinkedIn. I'm under my real name. Tier Simac. Twitter. I think I'm Mr. Charlie Martell. But hey, I, I could be verified this week for $8. Oh, really? So I might do that. And uh, what other social app? I think that's pretty much it. Okay. Uh, Only fans, if you can find it, you'll recognize my feet. They're all jacked up. Yeah, I saw your feet at hunting camp. They're Ooh. probably still blistered after that ascent. Brutal. Brutal um, feet. Yeah. And wh- what about your writings? Or is there places we can find your writings? In your podcast. Uh, so the podcast is called Allegedly. I told you I'd ask you about that. Yeah, yeah. Way to keep your word. You are a man of your word, sir. Yeah. Uh, it's called Allegedly. Um, and... It should be dropping on all platforms soon because uh, young Henry's going to help me with some of this editing. I've got episodes going all the way back to Everly Stocks out there to, to get out Damn. to launch. Yep. Okay. Brett Benton did my intro music and outro music. I just need to, just need to get it published. It's ready to go. Awesome. Yep. Uh, and the writing, um, I write both under my true name, uh, which Marty inadvertently outed me. <laughs> and under a, a former pen name, Charlie Martell. And uh, you can find me at Coffee or Die, Free Range American, and uh, possibly uh, an upcoming issue of Field Ethos if I get off my ass and actually write the thing. Nice. Okay. Yeah. And Dead Reckoning and Havoc Journal. I forgot about those two. Easier everywhere. Everywhere, all at once. Well, and Tears also, uh, the whole reason he's here this week is he's shooting some content for us on some medical kits we're selling. So, uh, you can go to our Montana Knife Company YouTube um, maybe by the time this drops or so, something right after that. Uh, you can actually watch Tier demonstrate tourniquet usage and application and combat gauze and all that stuff. So mm-hmm. um, you can actually see Tier kind of teach some of what he learned uh, when he became a doctor. In, in other countries. Yeah. So Dr. Tier Simon Mank. Esquire. <laughs> Tyre Simank. Tyre Simank. Yeah. Yeah. It's <laughs> Evans. That's how Evans pronunciation. Is it? Yeah. All right, Tier. Appreciate it, man. Okay, Josh. Henry. <laughs>